meeting of the Oshkosh Common Council. Uh, City Clerk, please take the roll. <coughs> Floam? Here. Stevenson? Here. Nichols? Here. Larson? Here. Mayor Bugawauer is excused absent. Esslinger? Here. Bula? Here. We have six present. Thank you. And leading us in the invocation tonight is Council Member Floam. As we gather tonight, we are grateful for the good things that have come to the city. May our decisions always be ones that are for the well-being of all whom we govern. Thank you. And leading us in the pledge tonight, we have a couple uh, students from Lakeside Elementary going to join me. Thank you. We have Easton. Come right up here. Turn around and face your parents so they can and Gunther. So a couple certificates for you guys. Thank you very much for the help tonight. And then like I said, I'm gonna give you the mic if you want to call our favorite teacher, favorite subject. My favorite subject is math and my favorite teacher is Miss Big Now. Mrs. LeClaire. <laughs> Love to hear math and science is the favorite, so good job. Thank you, kids. Thank you. All right, I do have one proclamation here that Matt has already issued, but I want to make sure it gets read right into the record. It is on uh, the extra mile day, November 1st, 2024. Whereas Oshkosh, Wisconsin is a community which acknowledges that special vibrancy exists within the entire community <coughs> when its individual citizens collectively go the extra mile in personal effort, volunteerism, and service. And whereas Oshkosh, Wisconsin is a community which encourages its citizens to maximize their personal contribution to the community by giving themselves wholeheartedly and with total effort, commitment, and conviction to their individual ambitions, family, friends, and community. And whereas Oshkosh, Wisconsin is a community which chooses to shine a light on and celebrate the individuals and organizations within the community who go the extra mile in order to make a difference and lift up fellow members of their community. And whereas Oshkosh, Wisconsin acknowledges the mission of Extra Mile America to create 550 Extra Mile cities in America and is proud to support Extra Mile Day on November 1st, 2024. Now therefore I, Carl Bulow, on behalf of Matt Mugerauer, Mayor of the City of Oshkosh, do hereby proclaim November 1st, 2024 as Extra Mile Day in the City of Oshkosh. I urge each in the community to take time on this day not only to go the extra mile in their own life, but also to acknowledge those who are inspirational in their efforts and commitment to make their organizations, families, community, country, or world a better place. Thank you. All right, leading off tonight, we have a couple presentations. Uh, leading us off is Go EDC with uh, Ms. Rathmerill. All right, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I just wanted to state, uh, start by saying thank you for, of course, being a partner for Greater Oshkosh EDC and um, all of the relationships that we have and, and what builds our organization. Um, as many people know, we are a public-private nonprofit, which means that we are supported, of course, by the city of Oshkosh and have a, you know, a specific set of services that we do on behalf of the, the city, and we are always proud to be that partner. Um, so just. Uh, and you do have the packet, I sent it. I sent the presentation around, so feel free to look at it. But I just wanted to start off by touching on kind of who we are and why we're here. Um, so Greater Oshkosh EDC, of course, we are here to be the leading economic development agency. Our goal is to draw security for our community, but again, focusing on how that impacts the, old, the whole, both our public and our private side. Um, but one of the things I really wanted to uh, focus on here before I jump into what we've been doing is 
the core values that we have as, a, as an organization. So as you see across the bottom there, those core values are really what leads a lot of how we do what we do for the city. Um, our leadership, um, we want to be responsive to the needs um, and also the changes that are happening in our economy. Um, the accountability that we have to both the community and our businesses that we work with. Uh, the innovation that we want to drive throughout all of the different areas, whether it be um, new ways to develop or driving new businesses, new engagement. Um, and then of course that last one I think is really important is the collaboration because we become better by working together. So that is one of some of the key things that we have there at GoEDC. So um, I just want to st start to a little bit. We, I'm, what I'm going to do tonight for you is I'm actually going to kick back and look back at what we've been doing for the last few years. We're wrapping up a strategic plan and we're in the process of actually um, launching our next plan. So I'll spend a little time talking about what we've done in our last strategic plan and then the process we're going through right now to get ready for our next plan. Uh, so this plan that we've just coming out of, uh, we're wrapping up COVID 2020. <laughs> um, we're trying to figure out what that new normal was and a lot of those challenges that we were seeing at that time was the supply chain. Um, our employers were facing massive employment vacancies. Some people were saying 10 to 15 percent, um, you know, employment needs that they had, open positions that they had within their organization. Um, today, they've shifted a little bit. I mean, we've seen this over the last year to, to two years is what we're continuing to see is yes, talent is an issue. Not quite where we were seeing it, uh, you know, three years ago. But we continue to see that the talent issue is that we know our workforce is growing smaller, not necessarily growing larger. Um, and that we need, we have a big need to retain that talent. And then how are we also attracting new talent here? But when that comes what we're looking at as well is just what are we doing to make sure that talent is what we need in terms of the skills for our businesses, in terms of um, you know the ability to teach what we currently have, what's coming up. And that goes right into number two, because our evolving technologies <laughs> are changing fast. And there's a lot of different ways that we are now working um, between automation, AI, things are coming into our workplaces that are impacting the way and the skills that our, our employees need. Um, kind of on that same topic, our housing needs are continuing to be very big issue. We cannot attract that talent and keep them here if they don't have a place to live. <laughs> so um, the housing study that the city did was a very timely project to do to help us evaluate really what we need and where we're going forward. But we continue to look at what types of housing we need for the different types of employees that we want to have or the type of people that we want to live here. So it's not just about that inventory, but it's also matching that inventory with the type of um, workforce and employees that we have. Um, and the last one I put on there is that competitive markets. So our markets continue to be, and this comes in so many different ways. Inflation has made our markets incredibly competitive when you look at supply chain and how we're being able to bring in uh, the different, um, what, uh, what all the different supply chain and the different resources that we need for our businesses to be successful. Um, we also look at interest rates and how they've made us very competitive in our, in our markets and how we're able to, you know, drive development and move forward. And then just within our neighborhoods, how we are competing with our, our fellow neighbors from, you know, whether it's up the highway, down the highway, um, maybe even a state over. One of the things that we're, we're learning quickly is that growth is focused around that workforce, like I said, but we're not so much about where the good jobs are, it's where the people are. Jobs are going to people, which we've talked about historically, people went to jobs, right? You created jobs, people went there, and now we're in a, and kind of turned on our heads where jobs are going to people. And so we need to be able to bring people here and have them want to stay here as a community. So uh, and when I talk about competitive markets, I know that if there's things that we aren't doing to make ourselves competitive, our neighbors are. So we have to make sure that we're, we're thinking forward focused. So those are some of the current challenges that we're seeing. But just to kind of review back of what we've been doing with our strategic plan. So over the last um, three years, We've kind of maintained, this is our core of uh, what we've kind of been working on over the years, but staying in, in this element. Existing business has always been our priority. So business retention and expansion has been huge in the last few years, um, especially looking at how we help our existing businesses grow um, when they're facing these workforce challenges, when they're facing supply chain challenges, and making sure that uh, this is the best place for them to expand their business, not to take it someplace else. Um, workforce development uh, has always been um, again, a focus as we look at how we recruit that talent. We focus a lot on barriers last few years. Transportation had been one that we've been had been addressing, but childcare popped up in the last in um, probably since about 2021 when that one really hit the market hard. We saw childcare becoming a significant barrier, so addressing those barriers to employment. Um, entrepreneurial growth is how we make sure we're again 
looking at innovation and, and moving forward. So programs like our Capital Catalyst program, working with startups and collaborating with Fox Valley Tech and UW Oshkosh on their programs to help nurture entrepreneurs in our city. And then lastly, targeted industry and community development is how we're looking to grow. So what can we do to make sure that we have a diverse industry, that our industry clusters work well together? And then also focusing on, like I mentioned before, what our community, and that is a community where people want to be. So a couple of statistics for you. Um, again, we're just, we haven't quite wrapped up our 2024 yet, so we went back to our 2023 statistics to show you a little bit how we're getting this done, some of the KPIs that we've had. Um, last year we did 24 in-depth business retention and expansion visits. That's where we spend a significant amount of time with the business, learning about it, understanding what their future is, and um, looking for red flags, green flags, usually. Uh, but overall, we had over 400 different business touch points. That's any time that we engage with the business, you know, intentionally. So whether it was a phone call, an email, um, exchange of information, uh, it was actually a direct communication that we had with the business in the area. Um, 15 different custom project services, and that's where we help businesses kind of work through if they're having expansion. We work with the city, we work with them and, on what challenges that we're having and making sure that we're moving uh, that along as smoothly as possible. And then 40 RFIs, requests for information, is when we have people who are interested in coming into our city or into our area, and we can submit them with information about available properties, buildings, lands, et cetera. Um, as I mentioned before, we try to tackle that child care issue. And in partnership with a handful of other nonprofits in the Oshkosh area, we got a Dream Up grant, um, which ended up creating 146 new childcare spots here in the city of Oshkosh. That was actually a grant that came from the state to try to address childcare issues, and we were able to put that into, I think it was 18 different um, existing child cares or new child cares to create new spots for them. Um, and then, of course, we always keep that unemployment rate on there because that's some of those challenges that we're facing. When you have a 2.7% interest or unemployment rate, essentially means that we're at full employment because you're always going to have a little bit of that overlap. So we know that we're at the point right now where we need people for the jobs that we have here, and we need to be able to recruit people to our area. So um, just a couple of highlights on different projects or initiatives that we did in the past year or so. Um, to give you an idea on that business development side, that data care development was actually many years in the progress, but that started with GoEDC when they reached out to us to find out where a good site. So we had submitted several sites to them. Um, we didn't know exactly who it was, but we had a pretty good idea at the time. <laughs> we had an, uh, a, a little bit of an idea, but we were able to um, work with their site selector to try to find an appropriate site here in Oshkosh, and the site that they selected was actually one that we had suggested to them. So. Um, and then I want to talk about Myers Aviation because I think this is a great project to talk about as well. As we look at how our existing businesses and retaining them, Myers came to us, um, the a few employees for the business wanted to purchase it from the existing owners, long-standing employees, and we work with them so that way they could purchase that business, kept that business local, um, and they've actually been able to do a lot of work in the last what, 18 months to, to really grow and um, put new, even more life into that business. So. I know that one of the questions that when this first came up, when Matt asked if we would present, was about our, our loan funds. So part of those programs that we run is we do have two loan funds on behalf of the city of Oshkosh that we, we administer. Um, so our access capital funds, the revolving loan fund is for existing businesses, and the capital catalyst are for those um, new businesses that are either startup, entrepreneur, um, some of that business of, uh, Entrepreneurship through acquisition falls into this category too because those are new business owners, even though it's an existing business. So these results that you see up here is actually the lifetime of the program. We've been administrating this program since 2015, um, the RLF program. But what I love to see about this is yes, we're supplying those loan funds um, and we really treat that like gap financing. But of the $2.1 million that we've dispersed, dispersed out in loans, it has actually resulted in over $11 million of capital investment. So that's how we see those dollars put to work by bringing businesses to the area, but then also making them successful and bringing additional, um, additional capital investment here. So um, again, just kind of our overlap of what we look when we roll up and we say, what have we done in the last um, <coughs> almost 10 years? We're sitting here now. Uh, we've created over 1,000 jobs. We've retained over 2,000 jobs. And that three point $375 million is that net capital investment for our area. And that comes from machinery, that comes from real estate, that comes from building expenses, and that all um, rolls in together. 
the number that we really like to say is for every dollar that's been invested into Go ADC has turned into $95 right back, back, right back into our community. So it is truly an investment that's made with our organization and we want to put that back in the community. And these are some of our investors and partners so you can take a look, we have that in front of you, of who actually we work with and supports our organization. So the what's next part. I wanted to spend more time on this, but we're not quite ready to release this plan to the public. We're still in that refinement phase. We're almost there. But uh, this past summer, we actually spent some time doing a feasibility study, taking a look again at what kind of economic development we need for our area. Uh, we focus a lot on what the business needs were, um, as well as uh, what our public needs were from our different municipalities. So that has been refined back into a plan. This new plan is going to be very agile. We want to realign with what we need in the area. We want to make sure that we are really focusing on growth and how we're finding that growth for our existing businesses and, and especially that population in our, um, in our workforce. And then also we just really want to be future oriented. We want to continue to look at what we need as a community and um, just like you sometimes we have to think not just about today. We have to think what tomorrow needs. So we really want to make sure that we're setting up a community that makes us dynamic. Um, so this, this, next year, this next plan compared to the three-year plans we've been running is going to be a five-year plan. And we want to make sure that we are looking at the next five years to really situa situate ourselves um, as solid as we can as we head out um, you know, into the end of this, uh, uh, the 20s. So yeah. So. Questions? I think I'm. Thank you. Yeah, any questions from council? Uh, Council Member Fulm. Thank you. Well, yeah. I very much appreciate you being here. I just want to um, <coughs> congratulate GoEDC with their work on the Theta Care project. It's coming along quite nicely, and a third floor is going to go up. So <laughs> it's great to see. One of the questions I have, and uh, and I know this is uh, kind of intergovernmental, uh, but the Aviation Business Park, that's one of the worst performing TIF districts, if not the worst performing TIF district in the city. I don't think there's any warm leads, at least last time I checked. You will know more than I do on that <laughs> front. Um, but at what point would GoEDC recommend a rezone for other options than just aviation-related businesses? I know the county has something to do with it as well. Um, but at least on the city side, this is looking like something that's becoming a white elephant, and we need to get a little bit creative on what to do next. Yep, very, very well stated. We have continued to look at that um, and working with the city staff on what that project should look like. One of the things that I said when I came in is I said, let's make sure that we actually give this a really good effort to, to exhaust because aviation was identified as one of those targeted industries for our area. Um, and that was done back in the DOD grant that we did a couple years ago. So we had put some effort into aviation prior. Um, I wanted to bring some of the knowledge that we had in my team to try to give it one more go. So post COVID, we did we have made a pretty concerted effort of working with site selectors. Now we have about you know we like you said hot leads. We have one or two that come up every once in a while, and so we've had some people that are interested, but we haven't had anybody to you know actually purchase. So. That has been something of discussion. We are limited on what we can do on the, on the co county side, but we aren't as limited on the city side, and we continue to work with city staff as to when is the right appropriate time mm -hmm. to put something that is outside of that zoning or outside of that sp specified zoning into that area. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Council Member Stevenson. Yeah, I'm just going to use this opportunity to talk about my favorite subject, housing. <laughs> 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 uh, I think you brought it up a number of times in your uh, uh, PowerPoint that uh, it's a barrier, it's something that we need, and uh, I really just want to call to that 2.7% unemployment rate. I mean, that is astoundingly low. Uh, I think the state is at 2.9 today, mm -hmm. uh, a little higher depending on who you go with, but I mean, full employment is somewhere from 5 to 7%, right? So we're way underneath that. We need people here, we need workers. Uh, nobody's sitting on the sideline right now. Oshkosh is working, uh, and we need to build housing to make sure we can get people here. Uh, so whenever I'm sitting up here touting we need to uh, get more housing, we need more uh, people here, this is one of the, the, the prime examples of why. Uh, we need to make sure our workforce is, is being filled, is growing. Uh, if we don't have the people, we, we don't have the jobs to be filled. So. Mm -hmm. So thank you for highlighting that. That's yes. all I, I wanted to point <laughs> out. So. I was just going to say that I think it's something that from an economic development standpoint, probably wasn't our radar when our organization was started um, 10 years ago, but today it is something that we continue to look at. And again, what we say, what we're not, what we're not doing our neighbors are. So making sure that we're staying competitive in these markets because incentivizing housing and getting the right type of housing into, these, into their communities is something that most forward thinking communities are doing right now. Well, if you're going to call out also numbers, I'm going to call one out too. That that 146 new childcare spots, um, people can't go to work if they don't have a place for, uh, you know, to to drop off the kids. So I, I think that's absolutely amazing. I know that's uh, projects that we've been looking at from the city council um, because it keeps bubbling up to us too. So uh, amazing job on that. Glad to see that. 
Thank you. And I can't hit the collaboration on that one enough because that was a large partnership between United Way, um, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Community Foundation was participating in, in getting that grant. So there's a lot of us that came together to get that grant. It had to be a cohort. It had to be a collaborative grant. So that was one of the ways that being collaborative makes us competitive. Absolutely. Anything else? All right. Thank you much, Trisha. Okay, thank you. And the next presentation, uh, probably less flowery, but I, I believe it's uh, the update on the City Hall facility study. I would say that's a matter of opinion, Mr. <laughs> Mayor. But uh, from staff standpoint, it's a very interesting uh, project. And John Wallenkamp with Cooney Architects is the firm that uh, was uh, retained to, to do this analysis. And I'm just going to let John take it over from there. John's worked with us on several projects, including the uh, Public Works Garage, as well as the Parks uh, Administration and uh, Field Operations Facility. So uh, I gave enough time for John to start distributing. And uh, John, take it away, please. Great. Good evening. Thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, as Mark mentioned, we're here to kind of the, give an update on the space needs assessment update. Um, a lot of information, but really the goal tonight is to make sure you guys hear where we're at kind of take it back, digest it, and get an questions and answers so we can bring answers back to you. Um, uh, the team at, uh, from our office is myself, uh, Randall, Shane, and Monica that have been working on the project, but I can tell you more importantly, it's been the uh, uh, divisions and department staff members that have participated and given us incredible feedback to help us bring kind of the report together to where it's at today. Mm -hmm. By no means is it complete. But we got at least to a, a level that we're very confident the square footages that we're going to be presenting tonight make sense, uh, which leads us to the multiple options we're going to talk about. Uh, the goal tonight is to talk about those three options, uh, primarily three options that we're talking about. It's existing city hall, uh, city center, and some additional site out there, a 17-acre site somewhere close within the proximity of the center of the city. Um, so those are the three major options we're going to talk about and kind of from start to finish um, we'll end from the square footages that go with each one. Each one has its unique characteristics I'll go over and more importantly each, each one carries a different price tag. Um, making sure you understand the current and future needs. Um, there are many. As it stands today there's a lot of divisions and departments that have immediate needs. The important thing to realize about that is you're doing the right thing right now is game planning for the future. But also need to remember if nothing happens in the future, you still have current needs that you, I think you need to start looking at of how you manage and take care of. Um, understand the process we went through. This process, I've been doing this for 33 years. Our firm is specialized in this. It's a process we feel really works well. And the reason it works well is it's a proven process that you're not overbuilding or underbuilding. This is a process that takes a lot of money, but it also, if it's done right, it saves you money. So as we go through this process, we'll also be introducing payback methods, things that you can see that through efficiencies, they actually help pay back. Now, it doesn't print money payback, but what it helps is, is in staff productivity or staff efficiencies, or maybe not even have to hire that half a uh, staff member to fill a position because we can operate a little bit more efficient. So those are the payback things that I would be talking about. Um, bottom line, get any questions and then if I can't provide the answers tonight in a later session come back with answers for you. This is just the beginning. As I said, we're just here to kind of get you going to see what we've been going through. Um, current and future growth. So what we did is we met with every uh, staff and division member to kind of talk over where they're at today and where they need to be. You'll see later on in the presentation the documents that we put together to do that. Um, the big thing here in the city is um, employee to citizen interaction. This building as it was originally designed as a school, 1915, 1960 turned into City Hall has a lot of space that you can kind of congregate and move about this building not the best thing to be in today's environment um, ADA a lot's been done for uh, uh, handicap accessibility but there again you're not there 
this report, when we're done with it, you'll at least have the road map of what you need to do by law to kind of slowly build up a future ADA compliant building. Um, improved uh, facility maintenance. Maintenance, as you guys know, is a, a budget number every year. So our goal is to improve that, but also improve the money you spend every year on maintenance. Uh, modernize the building access and security. That's a primary number one thing we need to start looking at. A lot of areas, as I talk about, you can go anywhere in this building and be anywhere. Our goal is to limit that circulation. And then bottom line, we looked at this facility and how the square footage was not the best laid out because it was a school. We have a lot of circulation space that we were able to wrap up into actual usable space. And as I go through the plan, I'll point that out. Um, and bottom line is something needs to be done eventually. And as the eventually goes, it goes with cost increase. So as I present the numbers, you'll see those are numbers to 2027. But if this goes to 30, the numbers just keep going up. So at some point, it's just good future planning how you want to tackle the, um, the situation you're in. This illustration isn't really meant to have you see exactly the numbers, but it's telling the story of what we did. So with each division and department head, we analyzed every worker and every individual, how they need to work within the facility. Are they in an office currently now? Do they need an office? What size office should they have? Everything was looked at that way. And these were dialed in by municipal standards that we've used over the years. But then also looking at, you know what, engineering may need a little bit more space because they're dealing with plans. So not everything's locked into that. We customize it for each user too. Um, to future employees, I can tell you the first run through with the group, I came back and said, you guys are being way too conservative. I've done this way too long to tell me you need nobody or one was so we worked with them and talked to them and created different scenarios in the plan like okay in the future we're going to need two spots well that might be a smaller conference room right now but in 10 years that conference room turns into office so we were very conservative how we did it or the conference room might be within the department's proper area and in the future that turns into a community conference room so all different scenarios we looked at um, as I talked to the standards, we went through these boilerplate pieces here to know exactly how an individual office would lay out how that individual office functions. So are we able to do a little bit larger office with a four-person conference room, a conference table, so we were able to save a larger conference room? So all those scenarios were looked at and studied. The, the big thing we kept hearing at the facility here is we have lack of meeting spaces. So that was one of the biggest things you'll see in the plan as we go through how we tackle that and also try to position those in that we have very little footsteps for the public that are coming to visit City Hall needed to travel to get to it. Um, the current City Hall site, which is what we're calling option one, has a current footprint. So the orange image you're seeing there, that's the current footprint of City Hall. It's a little over 12,000 square feet. Um, the uh, yellow to the plan north of that uh, talks about a 2,700 square foot addition. So in our master plan, what we figured out is that the, we're, we're looking at an addition to, like I said, plan north. The first floor footprint is smaller than floors two, three, and four, mainly because the ADA access to the building, instead of having that internal, we actually would introduce all that external, but still over the uh, um, uh, roof of the building. The upper right um, is the facilities maintenance facility, um, 7,500 square foot per floor. Analyze that. When we got into the program, Oshkosh Media, relieving the pressure of Oshkosh Media from this building and moving them into a remodeled section out there we felt was the best position. Um, they have a lot of outdoor or um, direct access from the public inside, so it plan-wise it worked well. So as we go through all the options two and three, I'll highlight that, how that makes a difference in uh, options two and three. But that's 15,000 square feet. 7,500 square feet of that alone is archive, 
cold storage, which is out there now. Um, part of the present, part of the cost sheets um, got a, a good dollar amount to scan documents that just need to be documented and then the paper copy thrown away. But there's a lot of documents that need to stay retained within the city and they'll constantly be moving. So that 7,500 square feet will always be a need for the city at some point. Um, new and proposed existing footprints in the upper left. Uh, <coughs> this is first floor. You can kind of see that uh, the, uh, the jut out of the um, illustration to the right. Our goal was to create 90% of the interaction that is building in day to day to happen immediately within 20 steps. So that addition has all the frontline counters. You come in the door and boom, you're right there. Um, this footprint also took the main existing square footage and we were able to cut the existing square footage, the circulation square footage down 55%. So it, we took it from 2,100 square feet down to uh, 1,100 square feet. The important piece to take out of that is the 1,100, the additional 1,100 which was able to go into usable square footage. So square footage we didn't have to add on to the building. Just to highlight, the orange is all these public spaces that we're talking about also. So council chambers is the orange on the left with breakout rooms, closed session rooms. The upper right is a, um, a multi-purpose room which was heavily in need. That would be large bid openings, uh, large interviews, training, city would all be on that first floor. Um, second floor, um, upper left again, but you can, in the bottom right, you can kind of see that gray circle. That's the circulation. We were able to tighten up the circumference of that. All these plans also have introduced the exterior facade, primarily have all the workstations, where all the natural daylighting will flood through and go to the internal office spaces. So a good majority of the spaces in the larger d divisions and departments have that where if I am in an internal office, I have glass windows looking through to the outside, but I don't have that direct access to the outside. Just a concept that feedback from other staff members and other municipalities, it, it, you're in this building a long time during the day, so everybody to experience that natural light is an important factor. Third floor, same type of concept. I, I should note that we met with the departments and divisions twice to review their numbers. They have not seen these plans. So you're seeing them at the same time. They're kind of seeing them. But we're very confident in the future spaces that we created. The adjacencies are there. That the square footage that we're representing as the whole that's needed is the correct number. As I see James critiquing his space. No, sorry. Um, here's the fourth floor. You can kind of see the fourth floor. Now the council chambers moved down, so it freed up space to move other divisions and departments. So it really opened up the area. The other large piece on the fourth floor we took advantage of is the mechanical space. If you've been in the mechanical room, take it, enjoy it, go in there. The equipment is old. It's from your, all that would be removed, encapsulated back into actual functional usable space. And that mechanical would go on, the uh, new mechanicals would go on the roof, except distribution of... Uh, electrical things like that, but primarily uh, on the roof. Uh, option two, um, city center. Um, I can tell you it's a, a fabulous building. It's on a 30 by 30 grid. Um, the, the challenge we were having here, so we use the same square footage. Um, we had about 59,000 um, square feet that was needed. I rounded it up to 60 because of the grid uh, layout of this facility. Um, this facility would only be on a, a level one and a level two, which made it a little tricky. So the blue uh, squares you're seeing there are uh, light wells that we introduced into the building to kind of give it apples to apples of exterior facade and windows that this building would have or a building of similar um, circumference uh, area. So the red is the proposed square footage of um, the first floor. Um, the upper half of that red is a single story building and then the bottom image is the second floor, um, second level. On this plan, the left side would be the, um, on the 75, the, the 15,000 square feet needed for Oshkosh Media and the uh, maintenance facilities department <coughs> because if this, this, this option two goes, 
this facility goes away, so does the building to the outside. So we have to recapture that 15,000 square feet. So that gives us a total of the 75,000 square feet that you'll see in the price tag. Option three um, goes back to a four-story building, primarily for reasons I said earlier, to encapsulate the maximum exterior lineal footage of um, exterior daylighting. If it would go to a two-story building, then the 17-acre site would just have to increase. So this is a 17-acre site with 200, uh, um, 200 spot parking stalls. And then uh, the blue is just representing, obviously, stormwater management would have to be included. Um, the cost sheets um, pretty much highlight all the square footages that we see from remodel square footage to addition square footage to Oshkosh Media remodeling square footage. Um, just to highlight in some areas like the City Hall, option one does not have purchasing of new land because we're staying here, nor does it have selling of this building because we're staying here. So some of the areas to look at that way. Um, option two, price tag. Um, that option there, as I mentioned, the introduction of the light wells uh, is, is a different line item in the upper um, second, uh, upper half of the building related uh, items. And then also the exterior facade upgrades. So um, introducing more exterior windows over there, but also creating more of a civic entrance um, on that single story um, part of the north, plan north of the building. Um, this cost also has to, uh, we need to address parking somewhere over there. We need put 200 parking stalls. So there's line items in there for the parking, how we address parking. That's a logistics thing based on the parking structure, how we get the city to have 200 parking stalls in addition to the uh, slab on grade parking stalls. In addition to the parking stalls maintenance that's required on the parking structure 10, 15, 20 years down the line, there's a line item in there for that. Option four, or I'm sorry, option three, pretty much all the same items, but there again, this one you would have the um, Oshkosh Media built into it again. You would have the purchase of the land. You would have the sale of the city hall. Option three also has the sale of the city hall in it. A quick rundown, you can kind of see the different square footages and the costs associated. So you're, you're talking anywhere from, um, the $30 million to the $37 million, depending on the option. These are all open for discussion items to make sure we're all understanding where numbers are coming from, how, they're, how we receive the numbers. But to us, they're current market day numbers on square footages of remodel to additions. Um, and then there's also a, a, a inflation factor built in there to take it to 2027. All the uh, Y items have been addressed in every one, two, and three option. Each one carries a little bit of a different uh, price tag potentially. As I, as I said earlier, the uh, light wells in option two aren't in option one or in option three because it's not an existing footprint that would require that. Um, so each option has different questions and we're here to really to help you understand end of the day, we're at about 46,000 46, square feet, and we need to get to 60,000 square feet plus the 15,000 for Oshkosh Media and maintenance facility. Th those numbers, we are very comfortable, are the accurate numbers. The plans we pre presented for City Hall are workable plans. Are they vetted out by the departments and divisions? No. But all the square footages they asked for and the specialty rooms we've asked for between server rooms to conference rooms to storage rooms to file rooms are in that plan. I'm guessing you're going to have some buttons. questions. Yep. <laughs> All right, uh, Councilmember Flom got in first. All right, so. Uh, a couple questions that I have on this. In terms of this building, one of the concerns that I have with this building overall is that while the plan that you presented, which was very well thought out and I appreciate it, makes sense for today, does it make sense 20 years from now? 
And that's the concern I have with staying at this site. And the worry is more, it's like, okay, yes, this may cost less now, but are we going to have to spend more in the future to make additional improvements? Uh, that's something that I do worry about. A new site, while well, today may look more expensive, and I would you know, want to double check the, the price options for city center specifically. I do think they are a little high, but um, moving forward, I would rather invest more now so we don't have to invest more later instead of a Band-Aid option. So I understand that you know option one is not necessarily what would be called a Band-Aid option, but my question is, are we just walking this along so that we're gonna be back here and having this conversation again in 10 years? Yeah, it's a great question. Have, no. So I apologize, I didn't answer it in the presentation. When we look at this building to remodel, we are taking it down to the concrete structure. Mm -hmm. There's nothing saved in this building except the concrete structure. All new windows, all new mechanical, all new electrical, all new flooring, all new. You're 100% down to poured concrete. Um, if, if you look at data on old buildings like this, thermally, because of the natural mass, you're actually money ahead already with that. But um, our goal is from a brand new build to this build of the city hall down to the structure like we're talking are apples for apples. Mm -hmm. Do you also plan on doing, and if this wasn't in your contract, I apologize, do you also plan on doing a needs assessment for each department and what they're looking for in terms of space requirements for yeah. the ones that are in this building? Oh, yeah, we did that already. So your document okay. has that for every division and every department in this building. Is that what you're saying that the yes. groups are? Yeah, we've analyzed that. And in your packet that you have there, you'll see every group, every staff position listed and also line items how many future and how that future per individual gets whether it's a cubicle a hard office number one number two how many future conference rooms that's all on that massive spreadsheet of you um, when you have time to take a look at okay thank you council member nichols thanks <clears throat> i just have a couple questions so it, what i'm hearing is that we need seventy five thousand square feet for long-term planning is that right fifteen thousand for oshkosh media sixty thousand for the operation of the city is that correct right? yep and I understand that we think we can get that in this building with the outbuildings. We know that we can get that if we build a, a new building because we get to decide everything. Um, for city center, is that 75,000 square feet or is it more or is it less? So city center would be the same. <clears throat> so it just happens that this building can fit the same amount of space as city center? Or is, or is there unused space in city center? I guess is my question. Oh, yeah. If, if you uh, look at the slide of the city center, the red, mm -hmm. Is just what we were saying will advocate for City Hall. The orange is leftover square footage City Hall does not need. Got it. And so that extra space, potentially we could use it for other synergies for the city. We could bring in museum storage, for example. We could bring in public exhibits. We could use it for something else. Um, and that would be included in that price tag. Is, is that right? Or are you excluded? No, that's excluded from the price tag. The Incredible. only thing in the price, yeah. price tag is the red. Inclu including the purchase price? Or would it just... The purchase price is in the cost sheet that I presented. I guess maybe let me ask a different way. When we buy city center, or if we were to buy city center, are we also buying the unused space? Or you're saying that we're gonna discount it, discount the price because we're not buying that space? You are not buying the orange section of the city center. Okay. Yep, I kept them apples for apples. So <coughs> square footage wise, they're all the same square footage because we did what you needed for 25, 30 years out. So the orange on that layout is not included in the city center price tag. Okay, but potentially when we're talking to the developer, just because this is a, it's a different, it's very yep. different than the first and third options. Potentially when we're talking to the developer, we could buy the whole thing and we just wouldn't use that portion of the space for the city hall purposes. 100%, that's, that's possible, correct. right? Yep, okay. 100%. I guess that's where I'm going. And, and maybe that addresses some of Jacob's concerns for, for future growth, but also we could use for uh, other things. <coughs> the second question I have about option three, mm -hmm. I know we mentioned, I think you mentioned it was 17 acres is what we would need. Um, and we would try to locate that close to city the city center it have we identified land that's that large where we would want it to be like where it would be accessible to the public but also in our kind of central business area no okay i, I think that's a challenge yeah. for that option nope. three 100 and yep. so i just want to call that out for everybody that yep. that's i don't yep. know that that's completely viable in my, in my mind uh because 17 acres is a, is a lot of land um and then i guess the, my last question is it, the reason that um City center on its face is appealing to me, and, and so I'll just show all my cards right now. 
um, is that we would be moving City Hall from a place that is near downtown to downtown. Um, I, I think that there is value there. I think it would help businesses in the area. Have you done any research or I are there any call outs for what the community impact would be uh, versus in keeping the city hall here versus moving it downtown to city center? No, w what I would focus back on is I think our goal with this assessment is first of all to see if a new city hall is needed. Sure. And then we can dive in deeper exactly by scoring where the best location is. And, yep. and so what I'm hearing though is it's a resounding yes, a new city hall is needed for a refurbished I, city hall. It, it, my opinion, yes. On space. But yeah, yep. Okay, yep. And, and also just to make sure that I'm understanding it, we're looking at a one, two, three million dollar difference in the actual price tag of these three options, right? So we're not, when we're talking about 30, 30 million dollars of cost to do this, we're, we're talking about a couple million dollars in difference in actual price tags and yeah, just to get that's the correct. building. Okay. Yep, that's correct. correct. Yep. That's helpful. If Besides build new. Question to follow up because these are great questions. The you know, one of the things John we talked about was with option two there's a little more uncertainty with that. So the numbers could be you know it might be on the low end for that number and a high end for the city hall. So in in full disclosure that is a little <coughs> up in the air plus you know we've got a, a facility cost and it's you know based on the tax rolls so we put a range in there that doesn't mean that we've discussed that anytime you put a land cost on one of these things in a public forum it's like oh that's the number not necessarily so i just wanted to point that out and anything else you want to add John? yeah we were given a wide range of sure. cost per square foot and we kind of use that in there um the the thought behind that is we kind of used it because if it goes up it just makes the options that much more, more lopsided so yeah, yeah and i guess to that point though also i saw that there was a it was a one to two million dollar line item for the sale of this building that that's a similar similar analogy right so there was a wide range there and it could be more than two million dollars for the sale of this building which would cut down actually the total cost of options two or three is that is that right yeah w historically what we've looked at on that is a lot of times we spend money we don't get money to get rid of a building like this sure. it actually goes into a different di you know so we hesitated on that even because a lot of times that number isn't even the number we listed it could be zero sure and to that point though yeah. assuming that we would repurpose this building to something like housing it might have value that's in excess of just the dollar value going yeah. towards city hall right well it'd be yeah and it, it helps you know it's, it's Taxes one way, taxes the other way. Yeah, and, and I'm not challenging you, of course. No, I'm, I'm just trying to con convey that there are lots of factors going into rather than just a $30 million price tag. That's kind of my goal. Yeah. Yep. It Thank would you. be easy to just go to the last page and say, oh, it's very obvious. Right. It's yeah. not <coughs> obvious. And that's there's caveats, and yeah. you're you're pointing them out, and, and they're they're all legitimate. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Council Member Stevenson. This is super helpful. Uh, I, I really like the breakdown. I really like the uh, the designs put together. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking at the parking cost for option two, is that to create 200 stalls? And is that... Uh, no, that, like that's I, to purchase 200 stalls. Okay. Yep. From the existing parking lot, or do we have to build that somewhere? That would be from the existing structure. Okay. Yep. That was my question. All right. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to go next. Excuse, and then excuse me. I should back up. There's like... I think we call it like 45. There's certain ones on grade, yep. but those would be primarily for visitors, and the others would be for staff and vehicles, uh, city vehicles in the structure. Sure. Sorry. Uh, Council Member Nichols hit most of my questions, but I really wanted to uh, touch base on the uh, swimming pool that we are above right now in our, in our parking lot, and will that affect, because obviously that can't leave, that, that's going to be permanent, will that affect our ability to repurpose this building or, or sell it or... It, it, well, as you saw from, from John's drawings, it wouldn't affect how to repurpose this building. In fact, we pushed it out, what, about 2,500 feet? Mm -hmm. So we got out. How far did we get to? Oh, um, you're, you're a good distance away from the parking structure. Uh, any redevelopment of this would need that stormwater. And James, I mean, so to me, it's site related. It just helps the site actually be more usable for parking. Yeah, that underground facility is a regional, not oh. necessarily for the site. That's why <clears throat> the existing parking lot has several biofilters for managing the site runoff. Yeah, so that the the structure, if you've been here less than 10 years, there is a stormwater uh, retention pond beneath the parking lot of City Hall. It took over a year to build. So that would remain there, and that would be 
we probably need to maintain that as almost a public parking lot uh, so that we maintained it for for maintenance purposes we don't have to do maintenance often but that would be required and uh, selling it and then going after our easement rights would probably be overly difficult I would recommend if we were to whatever we would do we would maintain the ownership of that that uh, parking lot so that we maintain the ownership of the structure yeah p101 there's a red kind of hash area that will give you the outline of that uh, underground detention area okay councilmember Plum. thank you and I guess this is more for city staff instead of instead of the architect here um, would be like for next steps <coughs> So in terms of engaging the public on this, I think it's important that we get some form of uh, opinion about what the public is looking for in a city hall. ADA accessibility is a big point for me, uh, but then further refining these proposals and then looking at what to give the council next is something that I would be interested in. I, I don't speak for all the council, obviously. Um, but moving forward from here and making sure that this is not a dead document, something needs to be done, it needs to be done rather quickly. Uh, so if we can kind of get a move on on refining these plans and what these look like, and we can probably try to narrow down the cost and trying to identify because we're going to have to make the expenditure soon and put it into the CIP at some point when that needs to happen uh, and making sure that the public is engaged on this and having some form of uh, public interaction. Uh, part of the reason we brought this back was the council had requested that we take a look at these three different mm -hmm. options. And I think that there was concern about sticker shock with the number, and I admitted that uh, the number of $30 million was really just some estimates based on the numbers that we did seven years ago we had done a similar study seven years ago but it needed to be refreshed so uh, mr. Co uh, mr. Wallenkamp went through and you know interviewed the departments to confirm that the square footages were you know up to date and everything so uh, the idea is our is our number adequate for the budget it depends I mean it's uh, but if you're looking at delaying it until say 2027 then you're upwards of over that thirty million dollars. Mm -hmm. If you did it earlier, it'd be less. So, and I think that's what what you were trying to say is, mm -hmm. you know, every year you delay it, you're going to add an inflation factor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in terms of what the council would want to talk to the public about, at, that would, you know, we could certainly, you know, gain public input. Um, my honest opinion is that they're going to be looking very much at the price tag because that's obviously what means the most to them. I don't think. They're necessary. We'll follow ADA requirements because that's what we're required to do. So that stuff we would just naturally do. Um, you know, do people think that the council uh, chambers is too big, too small? Well, that's where we rely on the professionalism of the architect to say, this is your standard council chambers for a community this size. This is standard office size. There's there's nothing elaborate or anything in that regard. Um, so it would really be more about how do you want to gain public input so you can make the tough decision um, part of this was uh, we're working on a facility plan uh, that we're planning to give you John Urban I'm going to put you on the spot like May April, April, May. April May is the idea but we moved this up accelerated this so you have this to start working with you don't have to make a final decision but now you know the numbers and now you can you can you know you you have every right to tip your hand about what your preferences are because ultimately you've got to live with the decision if, if you spend 30 plus million dollars you got to be able to defend it you got to be comfortable with the decision you make so uh, do we budget for it when do we budget for it you know if, if you're if you're hesitant tell us you're hesitant because there's no sense in budgeting it for 25 26 when you're saying I want to listen a little more you may delay it a year just to to buy time I'm not suggesting that I think staff would say we've been waiting on this a long time we would ask you to to consider this because we are getting tight we are really getting tight for especially with respect to um, meeting space um, we're, we're we are really at uh, uh, the end of our rope in terms of getting good space for for us to have public meetings and things like that mm -hmm. And I'm very appreciative that we had this conversation today. I know this was pulled from the CIP so that we could have this kind of conversation. And I want to uh, thank the architect for coming. Um, I know that we are going to have to make a decision at some point in the future and rather soon. Um, I, for the record, am partial to city center just for future proofing and for that space. Um, but again, this is why we had that conversation today and we'll go forward from here. So I appreciate it.
And, and I think also what I heard from you is you don't want to do this again in seven years no. and be in the same <laughs> spot. Uh, Councilmember Esslinger. Thank you. Uh, sir, um, <clears throat> just kind of wondering, you have the 2027 numbers. Can you explain how you arrived at those? And, you know, one thing I think we find in a lot of things that we put a lot of time, effort, and money into is we come up with what we believe something's going to cost. And then as we start and we start getting involved with it, I remember when I built my house, it was supposed to be X amount of dollars. And by the time it got done, it was X plus mm -hmm. whatever. So, um, you know, how did you arrive at these numbers? Is there some type of 10% uh, contingency uh, based on factors that we just don't know or we're looking into a crystal ball? Or, you know, how, how did you analyze yeah. these numbers? Um, great question. I want to make sure everyone understands. The numbers that are here are project numbers. So it's all inclusive. It's not building numbers because some of that might get a challenge for you and you want to understand that because someone will say, well, oh, I, I just built our new city hall for $230 a square foot. They're giving you the building square footage. So the bottom dollar line is the project. Um, the columns, the high and low, so you've got three really col uh, columns there that have numbers in it. The high and low really much just takes out the flex of next year's dollar values where we're at. And these are historical do dollars from facilities that we've been involved with, also double checking other municipalities that have done work similar to these buildings and dialing in those numbers per square foot. The 2027 one, is got the six percent inflation factor on it because it's multiple years so it's taking that high and low number to that um, contingency you'll actually see there's two lines for contingency in there there's a design contingency and a construction contingency the design contingency is because you're we're, we're at 10,000 feet right now we're very high level so does things might change up or down so that contingency um, number you know you're carrying on the one option, 2.2 to 2.6 just on contingency for design. That's why. Construction contingency exactly is what that is, is when you get into construction and there's unforeseen things or you add, that's the contingency. So eventually that um, design contingency goes away. Um, but to answer your question, it's historical data. It's us costing each area by square footage and also breaking it out by uh, divisions of construction. Okay, um, maybe one last question. Um, I'm assuming you've done many, many of these types of projects over your years. Um, historically speaking, do you know when you've given someone, like you've given us estimates here and the other projects that you've given estimates for, how close were you? Uh, and maybe it's a little unfair because the client wanted to do more than what you had in there, so it costs more. Uh, but you know, a percentage of what you've yep. uh, estimated, how over that, under that, and by what percent? Yeah, um, we're, we're proud to say 90 plus were on target with the cost estimate. Early in my career, we inherited so many projects that had a building cost that didn't have a project cost. And all of a sudden, every, every time you're over budget, well, you really aren't, you just had bad information. My goal is to make sure you have the right information because I know once a number is talked about, it's the number that's there. Mm -hmm. There's no advantage for me to sit here today and tell you it's $30 million when it's 35. I'm very confident in these numbers and our track record on doing these facilities. We do hundreds of thousands of square feet a year just of this planning. So that's... Hopefully that helps. It does. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> all right, Councilmember Nichols. And, and sorry to go again. I, I guess as I'm as I'm hearing all the other questions and, and I'm hearing you all talk and I'm hearing that our next step is to really determine not only what option we want, but when the option is and how do we budget for it, how do we communicate to the city. Um, really, I guess my question is your your planning and your budgeting and your options come from a place of there are a lot of assumptions about growth, there are a lot of assumptions about dollars, but it's also assuming that the structure of city departments remains 
static. Is, is that right? So everything is built the way it is today, and then it grows over time. Do I have that right? Yep. I think what might be helpful for me, and this isn't a question for you, but it, maybe it's for council, and, and maybe it's a bigger conversation. But on the private side, we go through, we have management consultants that we hire frequently just to determine if the structure of our business and the structure of our leadership it makes sense for the way our business has changed. And, and we're in a customer service focused business and when, in my job. Um, a city is obviously a customer service focused business, mm -hmm. if you think of it like a business. I wonder if before we actually determine what the correct option is, just to make sure that we're building it for future, we're building it for today as well, um, if we start looking, especially if we have a new city manager coming in, if we actually go the step of, of hiring a management consultant to come in and say, these are how our departments are structured today, this is how we communicate with citizens today, this is how we take feedback today, and maybe we could do it better um, in terms of structure and process. I know we've talked about auditing our, our process a little bit with how we communicate to people, but I wonder if that would be a natural next step before we spend $30 million on building a building that just allows us to have what we have today, when really we could look at a management consultant that would say, eh, your structure's wrong, so yeah. the building might need to look yeah. a little bit different. What, just going through it all the years, I'd, I'd recommend that you have each division and department do a presentation to you, the council, on their staffing and on their levels. You don't have big departments. No, no, I'm just saying, so I think that's a, st I, I would recommend starting with that before you start with a large fee of a management consultant, because you can save one person. To, you get what I'm saying? It, the, the dollars and the square footage might just not add up, but it might help the story of why you're doing it. And I'm glad you brought it up that way, yeah. uh, because I think when you, people think about management consultants, they think, oh my gosh, you're trying to reduce headcount. And that's not at all what oh, my no. goal would no, be. Yeah. No. Um, my goal would be to make sure maybe we don't have enough people. Yep. Uh, maybe our departments are not communicating the way that they could. Maybe we need people to actually sit in the same building rather than the different buildings that they're in right now. That would be my goal in hiring management consultant, because it, to your point, I, I could listen to all the departments, tell me what their staffing mm -hmm. is. Um, that's not my expertise. Yeah. I would love to have someone come in and say, wait a minute, other cities are doing it this different way, driving efficiency, the customer service is better, and citizen response to working with the city is also better. Um, that, that'd be my goal. Yep. All right. Uh, I'm just going to close with, uh, uh, you know, other members have talked about uh, their, their preferences. Um, I think option three for me is not really attainable. I don't see that land being available in a spot that's going to be conducive to city business. Um, and I worry that option one continues to put a square peg into a round hole. And, and I have every confidence that this will get uh, renovated in a way that it would work way better than it is now. Um, and we wouldn't have to have signs on our first floor that say 88 bathroom on the fourth floor um, and the elevators out. Uh, so I have confidence that option one would solve the immediate problems but uh, to me option two I think with the city center gives us almost a blank canvas to make sure that the square peg is in a square hole right away um, and so I, I've heard a couple other people say that I'm not going to speak for the council just like I know uh, Mayor Mugerauer wouldn't but um, I, I would really like to hear more about that and, and what could be done there um, and uh, move from there <coughs> but thank you for going I guess if we're clarifying options, I don't have a preference right now. I want to digest this. You threw a lot of information at us, a lot of good stuff. So I guess uh, I would agree that option three, I think, is a little bit off the table, but the other two I'd like to look into a little bit more. So, Yeah, and really the goal is if the if next workshop, if we need to be present, we're here to keep uh, feeding information to you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you. Thanks. All right, next up on the agenda is citizen statements to council. So this would be things that are not on the agenda. I do have one person uh, who registered to speak. Amber, did you want to talk about uh, um, an agenda item or something that's not on the agenda today? Okay, then uh, come on up. Oh, right over here, if you would, please. <laughs> you get your own special mic. <laughs> Never done this before. Got a short, too. Uh, my name is Amber Jesslin. Um, I am both the lead pastor of Revival Street Church. I'm an RN, and I'm also an area business owner in Oshkosh. 
and I want to thank you all for just listening to me today. This is really awesome. And I know you all care about the community just as much as I do, so I appreciate that. And Carl, I recognize your face from the food pantry, so <laughs> thanks for stepping up and being our deputy mayor. Okay, so I want to talk about house keys, not handcuffs today. So back in May, my husband and I started a homeless ministry where we do church every week with the homeless um, in the park downtown by the sundial. Uh, we reach out to them for their physical needs, but also their spiritual needs. Um, we do a lot of um, food delivery to them in the community. Uh, but the biggest thing that we've seen lately is um, criminalization of homelessness in Oshkosh. And I don't know if you guys are aware of this or not, but many homeless people are getting fined for everyday things. They're getting kicked out of places where they are allowed to belong. Places like the public library during the day. Um, I spent an hour yesterday consoling this man who was given a $295 fine and he had to decide whether he was going to not pay it and go to jail or pay it and not eat. That's not right. And so that's why I wanted to come and talk today. I'm sorry I'm crying, but this is near and dear to my heart. These are real people with real issues. Many of them are displaced because their rent has doubled or they have lost their job or they um, were in the hospital for several months and they have nowhere to go. And they're sleeping on the ground, mostly by Salvation Army. There are many who are housed at the um, homeless shelter, but there are about 30 to 40 people I know personally who are not housed right now. And they are not allowed to sleep in public places that are warm and comfortable. Um, the police are now kicking out, and I love the police. I'm not against them by any means. We are on the same team. But they're kicking people out of the downtown park, which is the most comfortable place to, to, and the most safe place to sleep because it's lit up. People are less likely to bother them, less likely to harm them, but they're not allowed to sleep there. The only place that I know that they're publicly allowed to sleep right now is by the Salvation Army in the back parking lot, and that is the only place on the hard ground. I don't know if you've ever been camping, but sleeping on the hard ground is not good. They might get two to three hours of sleep a night, we expect them to be part of normal society and to be able to function and to be able to get a job and to find housing. They need proper sleep. This needs to be taken care of. That's why I'm here. I don't know what to do. I know what to do for them spiritually. I know how to meet their, their needs, but I can't house 40 people in my basement. It's not going to work. So we as a community need to step up. We need somewhere for emergency housing for these people. There's no reason that the homeless shelter should turn anyone away. They can put mats on the floor. They don't need a giant bed. The old day-by-day -day shelter had a lot of space. I don't know why we're not still utilizing that and having volunteers come and help with that, but that is something we could easily do. Um, as far as uh, meeting the needs of people going to the bathroom, if area businesses don't want to allow people in to use their bathrooms, we could put a porta potty outside. That's something easy we could do down by the sundial. And I understand, as an area business owner myself, uh, that I run a six-figure business, that that might influence people coming to their businesses. We need to be proactive in our community on loving on the homeless and having community outreach that allows people to understand these people are not here to harm you or hurt you. They need a hand up. They don't need to be criminalized for being just living. Like you can put yourself in their shoes for just a moment and imagine what it would be like not knowing where your next meal comes from. Not where, knowing where you're going to sleep tonight and wondering if your fingers and toes are going to freeze off tonight. That is a huge deal. One of the homeless people who is very mentally ill and she can't follow normal human rules. She's been living in the park for many years. Luckily, the police leave her alone because they know that she's truly homeless and can't be out. Um, she lost all of her toes last year. Every single one. She's lucky she can still walk. I'm in tears because I don't know what to do about this. I'm <clears throat> presenting it to you because you're very smart. I listen to all of you and I'm like, wow, they can come with so up with solutions that I can't. So I'm putting this in your hands. And one of the things I want to remind you is what we do unto the homeless, we do unto Jesus. He was homeless. I was recently in Ireland and there is a sculpture of Jesus on a bench and he's homeless. Why would we kick Jesus out of the park? Why would we refuse to help him? Think about that for a moment. So I want you to put yourself in, in their shoes and imagine what it's like. And I myself, and, and you might wonder, what have I done to help them besides minister to them? 
In 2020, I took a meth and heroin addict into my home, and we rehabilitated him, and we took him to church three times a week. And he got baptized, and he became a mighty man of God. And this year, he is about to graduate from ADOA counseling school. He's going to have a normal and a real life. But that took time and dedication and love. And we need to do that in our own community. It can't just be one person doing that. We need to do that as a whole. So I don't know what exactly to propose besides not criminalizing things and offering more housing, but I'm sure that you're going to have thoughts and dreams and different things that the Holy Spirit's going to put on your heart because we've been praying for that. You might have already had ideas before you even got here. Listen. Listen to the Holy Spirit. God is speaking to you whether you know it or not. It doesn't matter if you believe. He will speak to you. Listen. Do what's right. Do what's in your heart. Please help. Don't harm or criminalize the homeless. Thank you. At this time, I don't have anybody else registered to speak. Would anybody like to speak at this time? Or we'll move on to our consent agenda. All right. Uh, seeing none, uh, next up is consent agenda. I need a motion and a second. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? <coughs> Would City Clerk please take the roll on the consent agenda, please? Flom? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Nichols? Aye. Larson? Aye. Esslinger? Aye. Bulow? Aye. Carried six. Thank you. Next on to new ordinances. Uh, we only have one. It is Ordinance 24560. Approved zone change from heavy industrial district to heavy industrial district with a planned development overlay at 2875 Alice Avenue. Uh, plan Commission recommends approval. Need a motion and a second. Move it. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, please take the roll. Flum? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Nichols? Aye. Larson? Aye. Esslinger? Aye. Bulow? Aye. This was a new did oh. you want to play the rules and go down it on the first? It has no asterisk. No asterisk. Mm -hmm. No asterisk. My mistake. Yep. <laughs> it's oh, it's a new ordinance. Yep. Yeah, I I'm used to seeing I, the asterisk yep, there. Yep, I see that. Yep. Okay. So, uh, we'll need to rescind that motion a second first. We'll do a first reading. Yes. Okay. Mm. Is there do, do we have to, do we have we have to, to move to invalidate the vote yeah. or something? Yeah, we would have yeah. to Could, move to invalidate the vote that we just right. took. Second. <laughs> Let me do a, a previous question. It was like, wait a minute. Can we do a motion to reconsider? You could do a motion to rescind it. Okay. Or I move to rescind the vote on ordinance 24-560. I'll second whoever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we have to all vote on rescinding it. Rescinding, okay. rescinding okay. that? Yeah. Okay. Flom? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Nichols? Aye. Larson? Aye. Esslinger? Aye. Bulow? Aye. Carried six. We'll just put it on next agenda. Yeah. Your turn. Yeah, okay. So consider that the first reading. <laughs> Sorry, I did not catch that. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> threw me off. Matt's never going to leave again. Uh, new resolutions where we will have action tonight. Uh, resolution uh, 24561, amend capital improvement program to include Lakeshore Drive reimagination in 2027. You need a motion and a second. Move it. Second. <coughs> Figured that was going to happen. <laughs> All right. First up is Councilman uh, Nichols. Thank you. So at, at Plan Commission, we had a workshop related to uh, the Clearwells project on uh, last Tuesday, um, and there was a lot of conversation about uh, landscaping of that property, landscaping of the park-owned property across the street between uh, the Clearwells, what were the the new clear wells will be the, the water treatment plant site and, and the lake and then also across Merritt and Menominee Park. Um, the next thing on the agenda is to talk about a landscape architect for all of that, but before we get there, uh, this is a CIP amendment related to funding of, of some of that landscape development and reimagination. Um, and and I, I don't know, James or, or Mark, if you'd be willing to, to speak to kind of 
why the workshop happened and, and kind of where the, the project went and, and how, why we're doing this today. Yeah, the, the workshop uh, with Plan Commission last week was really to talk about the architectural features on the storage tanks and the pump house. Um, a, as you mentioned, uh, there was a lot of discussion about landscaping on the site versus uh, in you know the uh, Lakeshore Drive area and the park across the street. Um, you know, as council may recall from the direction that was given to staff. Uh, late last year was to uh, retain a landscape architect to help with the reimagination of Lakeshore Drive uh, because engineers are good at drawing lines and not creating pretty pictures. I will admit that. Um, you know, so that is you know a, a big part of the direction that we were given. Um, and I think as we talked about it at Plan Commission last week, we wanted to make sure that as an organization we were showing the commitment to implementing what will ultimately be recommended as a part of the next resolution but we wanted to show that to commitment to implementing that project it is not currently listed in the capital improvement program plan uh, so this is to amend the plan to include it in 2027 um, obviously funding of that would not be uh, a part of any budget resolution until you know late 2026 as we're talking about the budget for the next year but this is to sh organizationally show that we are absolutely committed to implementing this project that we're going to be working on the design of as, as a part of the next resolution thank you and, and as part of that conversation something that I mentioned at Plan Commission so whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or an independent or none of those things um, there's a natural distrust with government something that um, the citizens of Oshkosh I do truly believe trust us with is that they're gonna turn on their taps and they're gonna get water and they're gonna be able to drink it and so I think that that's a, this is a lot about our engineering department um, but to James's point engineers are not artists um, otherwise you would be an artist and not an engineer probably <laughs> um, but with that I know there was a lot of citizen involvement there was an ad hoc committee that was created to talk about how the building is gonna look how landscaping is gonna look um, it, and the reality is that the, the water treatment site is a limited amount of space for landscaping um, the the land where there's gonna actually be beautification is actually park land in a lot of places uh, which is why we're hiring the landscape architect so I'm glad that we are gonna designate two and a half million dollars to fund that project two years from now um, I'm glad that we're gonna be able to move forward actually ensuring that we have compliant clear wells that there was an issue with the state and they said that we have to change the clear wells that's kind of how we got here but that we're gonna be in a place where we continue to have uh, clean water when we turn on our taps that's a really good thing but also that our front porch of Oshkosh on the lakeshore is gonna still look beautiful so I'm glad we're doing this and I'll support it thanks Thank you. <coughs> Council Member Flom. I'm going to second what Council Member Nichols said. Uh, this is something that I am uh, excited about in terms of clean water. One of the quick questions that I have, though, is just making sure. I know there was an ad hoc committee uh, that approved and recommended uh, a landscape architect, but when it comes down to what the landscape architect actually comes back with, is there going to be the opportunity for at least the neighborhood association and the relevant stakeholders to have a chance to look at it before Council considers it? Yeah, we have built in a, a number of um, presentations be it workshops and uh, public information meetings um, whether that be you know a true public information meeting uh, several board and commission meetings um, you know obviously with this being partially parkland you know advisory park board will be a big part of those conversations so we have built into the scope of services for the landscape architect uh, numerous workshops and meetings um, for public involvement and engagement as well as providing workshop information to you as a council okay I appreciate that thank you council member Larson I'm gonna echo all the same I'm very grateful that PC came up with a solution I think it was great DJ thanks for working on it James thank you also I went back and watched the September 23rd meeting where this was discussed last with council and there was lots of consensus about the building should look pretty and there was lots of consensus about we don't like the drawings we got so far you can you talked about it because they weren't done yet right so the whether there was actual consensus given that the landscaping needed to be done with the project or otherwise I understand that it may not be possible anyway there was lots of consensus the last time this came up at council that they wanted to see that and we do too so I think this is a great way to move forward thank you council member Stevenson I pressed my button before I knew everybody was going to say everything I wanted to say. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think I was quoted in the Herald as saying to engineering. Uh, so uh, I think that's where we uh, kind of landed with this as uh, we wanted to get a landscape architect in there. And no discredited engineers. You guys do a great job. But uh, we wanted some kind of more uh, art, artsy folks on, on cue to do this one. Uh, I also want to thank 
uh, your department and, uh, and DJ for kind of working on this one. And uh, I do think it shows commitment uh, for us uh, doing this in the, in the future. And I think that's what everybody's worry is, is that we're not going to commit to this. We're going to get a clear old project done and then not do uh, the park space. But I think this shows that we're committed to both projects. I certainly don't want to slow down the clear wells projects we need clean water, we need have a, a significant amount of money kind of socked away to, to try to pay for this thing. So uh, I know these projects, while hopefully are done in semi-tandem, can uh, they can break a little bit if they need to. I think Clearwells is, is the more important, more Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? It's the water is a basic necessity. So. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things you just said, Council Member Stevenson, is important. These are two different projects you know the zoning approvals for the Clearwell and the water filtration plant site those are limited to the perimeter you know of the actual parcel um, a lot of this work for the reimagination of Lakeshore Drive and the rest of the beautification with park and that's outside of you know the actual water filtration plant site so it you know it cannot be a part of the zoning approvals because they have to be looked at separately um, you know this you know the construction project for building the new uh, clear wells and pump station that is about a three-year construction process uh, we can only take about half of the system down at a time build the first half spend some time operating it to make sure it works the way it's supposed to and then we can start building the second half um, I also think it's important to note that you know we've talked about it a little bit but the Lakeshore Drive will be closed during the entirety of that construction project the contractor needs that area for staging of equipment and materials and parking of their staff um, as we've talked with planning services on our submittals um, they've recommended to us and it's something you'll see at a future council meeting of you know expanding that staging and storage into what is the little bit of parkland between Lakeshore Drive and and Lake Winnebago because the right-of-way is just not wide enough to accommodate everything that's going to be needed during construction yeah no great points thank you <clears throat> excellent the only thing I didn't hear yet um, and I, I didn't go back and watch it because I remember I was up here um, and we talked about making sure that we had some input from our indigenous uh, and tribal um, uh, people that are, are you know the first inhabitants of this area um, have you had any luck reaching out to have any artwork have have some of the um, you know working with this professional designer to make sure that we are honoring that as well I, if I could ask museum director uh, Canizzo to come up and help me with that um, certainly as soon as we received the direction from council last year um, we reached out to then director Phillips and um, since Anna has taken over we've worked with Anna and uh, the museum's graphic artist uh, Daniel Pfizer uh, on how to incorporate that aspect of it and um, Anna's got some amazing insights and given us some great um, thoughts on, on where it is appropriate and, and maybe not appropriate to, to do that. Yeah. Even the engineers realize they're not artsy. <laughs> it's a self-awareness thing. Um, honestly, I'm not artsy either. <laughs> I, I'm more science-y. I'm archaeology. That went to my sister's, the artsy one. But um, So yeah, we were contacted to provide some input about this very subject matter. And when it comes to um, what we thought would be good themes to present on the exterior of the facade of the building, we wanted to keep it where it was something timeless, where it would honor the indigenous past um, no matter the time and space. And so really focusing on the natural features, sturgeon were important to all peoples, no matter if it was shortly after the Ice Age up to present day, they're all very important. Wild rice, the same thing. So it, it didn't focus specifically on a specific culture, but really something that expanded time and space for all the indigenous cultures that occupied since the beginning, the Menominee, their ancestors, as well as the Ho-Chunk, but also the um, groups that came in, Stockbridge, Muncie, Mohican, Oneida, all these communities that came and went, you know, the, the subject matter was important. <coughs> the, so we, we focused on keeping it on the natural resources. When it came to um, focusing on some of the input of it, um, we thought it was best, since the museum has recently expanded its scope and mission to include public art, we have that um, merged board now, the Museum Arts and Culture Board, <coughs> excuse me, the Museum Arts and Culture Board. So now we have the oversight of public art. So that includes acquisition, deaccession, maintenance, care, um, all, all the things that go on with cultural heritage management. 
um, we gave some advice um, because this board, the Museum Arts and Culture Board, really serves in an advisory capacity um, for council, for our colleagues, for the city manager um, to provide advice on what direction to go in. I provided the advice not to put original commissioned artwork on the exterior of a building that is deemed critical infrastructure because we'll have competing for a variety of reasons. Let me put on my cultural preservation cap. Um, I look at it that we'll have competing, um, competing priorities for care when it comes to that. So if we have an original commission of indigenous art on the exterior of the building um, and it cracks, uh, it needs to repair, it needs to be restored, I would bring in a conservator to do that, not um, a, a facilities maintenance to just patch a hole or to clean it up. So from a stewardship perspective, putting it on a piece of critical infrastructure I think is the wrong canvas for it. I think it's an excellent idea to engage with the indigenous community and do some sort of original commission. I think that on the building, it's the wrong spot for it. I think to incorporate it into the... Um, the, um, the information education component of the yes. reimagination. <laughs> Thanks, James. <laughs> see, see how we collaborate <laughs> together? Um, and part of that educational component could be uh, an original commission piece of artwork um, I've spoke with um, members of the Menominee Nation about having their input for our own exhibits at the museum, but also um, just engaging with them to ensure that their voice is part of the curatorial and interpretation of what we do. So I had um, consulted with the Smithsonian on um, uh, an exhibition on waterways, just for example. And part of that um, was the exploration of water, not just from a scientific perspective but also from a cultural perspective so there's opportunity to engage that cultural voice in the interpretation of that educational component but I also think it's a unique opportunity to also have a commissioned piece as part of that component so and I'll put on my curatorial hat so the community can engage with it on the facade it's hard to really present interpretation to go along with it where the community can engage with it and they can really see it I think treated in a holistic installation way as part of this educational component um, would be a great way to engage the indigenous community on that component. Um, it's something we're planning on doing at the museum um, with our next phase of exhibitions. I, I'm so happy some of you have taken a tour and been so generous with your time and hearing me talk about our plans. But I see that extending outward with our expanded mission of public arts. Um, the other part of that too is we don't yet have a framework or a, a public art policy yet. That's part of the next strategic plan that you all adopted recently. Um, so creating a public art policy that provides the criteria for acquisition, for care, for conservation. So um, we have a collections management policy at the Oshkosh Public Museum that is the guiding document in what we acquire, why we acquire it, can we take care of it? Can we store it? Can we make it accessible to help guide those decisions? So part of what myself working with the Museum Arts and Culture Board will be doing early next year, it's like at the top of our list, is creating that document, that policy that you all can lean on to help make those decisions. And so I will be working with a variety of departments in helping serve in that advisory capacity way. And so I wish we had that now, but um, we're so early on in us as a new board. We have the museum part down. We have that. Um, but the public art policy part is forthcoming. And the plan is to get it completed next year so that way you as a council, my colleagues have um, that to lean on. Just like at the museum, we lean on our collections management policy to guide those decisions and, um, and ensure that we are being appropriate stewards now, but also cognizant of the fact that we're making decisions for the future. Um, we are dealing with lots of decisions that were made a hundred years ago um, that has, you know, not considered certain factors. So just for example, if we put original artwork on the facade of this building and took care of it for a hundred years, time for a new building, what happens to it? So those are the types of things that we need to really thoughtfully and mindfully 
um, tease out as we make those decisions. So I think, I don't know if I answered everything, but I, I'm happy to. Yeah. As the person who answered it or asked it, I don't think you could have answered it better. <laughs> um, I can keep talking. No. And as somebody who um, doesn't do art or history, you, I, I, I thank you for bringing that expertise. When I made the comment sitting in Councilman Larson's seat over there, that's what I wanted is somebody who has much more cultural literacy and sensitivity than me and, and has those connections to be able to make um, that recommendation to us. So I very much appreciate it. Yeah. And that's why I went to them. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I really, I, I understand that, you know, public trust was brought up. And part of core to museum work is maintaining the public's trust. The public is trusting us to maintain and care for their history, their culture in perpetuity. So in making these types of decisions, we should be really thorough and mindful in doing that. And in really being aware of what we're signing up for. I think it's an absolutely amazing idea to engage the indigenous community. We've done so much work already about it, uh, with it. And so I look forward to being able to extend that skill set that in that advisory um, um, position to my colleagues and other departments as you know the community uh, embraces more public art and also cares for and maintains the existing public art that we have. Thank you. You're welcome. For those at home that have not been to the Oshkosh Public Museum lately, go. They have some amazing exhibits that will answer a lot of these questions. Sorry, off topic. Uh, anything else? All right, we can take the uh, roll on 24-561, please. Flum. Aye. I'm sorry, Stevenson. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> Nichols? Aye. Larson? Aye. Esslinger? Aye. Bulow? Aye. Carried six. All right. On to 24562, approved professional services agreement with uh, Seiki Design Incorporated for Landscape Architect Services for Lakeshore Drive reimagined related to the water filtration plant clear walls re replacement project. Move to approve. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I cut you off. Sorry. No, you're fine. <laughs> Discussion. All right, Council Member Nichols. Thanks. As part of the, the scope here, is there a plan to require, and, and if you say no, I'm going to make a motion after people have a chance to talk, so that's where I'm going with this. Um, is there a plan to require Indigenous art and require people to work with the ad hoc committee, or this firm to work with the ad hoc committee that existed to determine landscaping for this in the in, at, at the outset? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, that was a that was a primary reason for us engaging uh, the museum staff to get that information. Um, while while the firm may not you know necessarily work directly with an artist, that's what we would rely on the contacts that um, the the museum and director Canizzo have to to work that in. But that will be a, a big part of the overall reimagination is is having those uh, art uh, those locations for that information education related to the uh, the indigenous population and and how it ties together with the themes of the sturgeon at, oh, excuse me the sturgeon and the rice uh, that you'll see when you, the uh, architectural uh, drawings are, are presented but but today the the sow the scope of work that we're going to sign with the architecture firm does not include the requirement or, do, or does it? That's I guess what I'm asking. Are, are they required to designate places for indigenous art and to work with the ad hoc committee, or is that something that doesn't exist today in the scope? It's no to the first one and yes to the second one. Your okay. question about there's details about common council meetings, plan commission, public information meetings, advisory park meetings, design team meetings, page turn meetings, lots of meetings, but I don't see anything that specifically says you know, engage the indigenous community. I think James, their intent is to absolutely yeah. do that. Yeah, but that it's not specifically mentioned, so. And, you know, there will be a space incorporated in what they're doing. They may not be the one engaging with the artist. You know, that may be us and, and the museum staff, but there will be a space, you know, in what they are providing. You know, it isn't necessarily called out in the scope of work. No, but that has already been communicated to them in our, our scoping meetings that, you know, this is something that we uh, we have an expectation of. And if you have that commitment, and I understand we're all being recorded, so everyone's going to look at, at this video later, 
um, if you have that commitment that we are going to engage indigenous artists for public art installations related to this, I think that's going to allay some of the concerns. I know Carl's gotten some emails. I think that's where his question came from. I know I've gotten some emails. That's where that's where this question is coming from. I want to make sure we are engaging that community. And any time that we can add public art, um, I'm looking back at the museum director. I, I'm all for that. So I support it and, and appreciate that. Uh, just as by way of background, one of the reasons that we chose Psyche was they were involved in the Butamore Causeway and there was a great deal of interaction with the Native American tribes uh, and uh, that's and so actually the um, the causeway was designed with all of these cultural features and then when it came to doing that wall that you see over by two brothers mm -hmm. um, I'm going to show a little love to the engineers, but not much. <laughs> they liked stripes. Uh, and that's when we engaged the museum to come back and say, there are some things we can do. So they modified some art, existing art. That's why Anne is very careful about saying the you know, original art. It wasn't original art that you see over there. It's inspired by some original art. And that was due <coughs> to Psyche saying, look, this is what you need to do at the, um, on the causeway. And so we just carried on from that. So they're very uh, committed to this. I, by reputation, they are. Uh, but you asked me a specific question, I gave you a specific answer. But I, I think they'll do exactly how James and, described it. And they have a, a rather long working relationship with the museum already. They have okay. done a number of projects uh, with the museum. And when, when our staff met with Anna and her staff, they were ex you know, extremely complimentary of the work that they have done. And um, you know, one of our public work staff has worked with them on a project at a previous employment as well and had amazing success with them. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> Seeing none, please take the roll. Flom? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Nichols? Aye. Larson? Aye. Esslinger? Aye. Bulow? Aye. Carried six. <coughs> All right. Uh, resolution 24-563, approve a 2024 neighborhood uh, Great Neighborhoods Capital Improvement Plan Programs funding in the amount of $72,500. Need a motion and a second. Move it. Second. Discussion and flow will take us away. I just want to um, highlight some of the recommended projects here. Utility box wraps are, I think, really neat. I think they highlight our neighborhoods and how unique they are. Um, I'm outside a lot. I'm, I'm running almost every day. And so when you see that kind of stuff, I think it's really, it's really nice to look at. I think it's really good for uh, just good neighborhood identity and seeing the diversity of neighborhoods that we have in town here. Um, and looking at that, I, I am quite happy to support this. So thank you. Councilmember Stevenson. Since you brought up utility boxes, I'm going to plug my neighborhood. <laughs> uh, my neighborhood was the first one to put uh, neighborhood utility box wraps on it, so uh, we are very proud of those. <laughs> Midtown. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody else? Seeing none, please take the roll on 24 5 at 63. Flum? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Nichols? Aye. Larson? Aye. Esslinger? Aye. Bulo? Aye. Carried six. All right, on to <coughs> council discussion, direction to city manager, and future agenda items. Uh, item 21A, Oshkosh Area Metropolitan Planning Organization Electric Vehicle Readiness Plan. The, uh, the council may recall that the Transportation Committee had held a meeting that council was invited to. A couple of council members were there. Uh, I know others watched it and others you know, followed it with great interest. Um, Mr. Collins is here because it, part of it was, is there any additional direction that you want to give us? Um, I think really what we're looking for is, um, and I was asked some questions, are, is, are EV projects in the capital improvement plan? The answer is no. Uh, the idea though is to put ourselves in a position that should funding become available for grants or anything, it's incorporated into a plan. Uh, with that knowledge, East Central uh, Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission is having their Metropolitan Planning Organization meeting. Uh, neither the mayor nor myself will be there, but Deputy Mayor Bulow will be there. Uh, and I believe that um, East Central is going to adopt it from a regional standpoint. Um, so that means, you know, for the entire Oshkosh area, because it's not just the city, it's the whole Oshkosh region, that they're identifying it as a plan that they accept and so 
uh, would you like us to bring this back for a future agenda item? Jim, did I cover that, or is there something else that I missed? Uh, no, I, I think you covered that pretty well. Um, I, I, th I know most of the council is aware of, of the plan. I'll just give you a, a real brief summary. Um, so for the last two years, um, started a few years ago, we've gotten requests from business owners, um, the hotel convention center, um, some other businesses in the area, um, and visitors as well about electric vehicle charging. Um, and the questions were, what does the city have available? What are the city's plans for EV charging going forward? Um, and at the time, we didn't have anything. So we thought it'd be a good idea to work on this a little bit, get some information. Um, so we worked with the East Central Regional Planning Commission to hire a consultant to help study uh, EVs. And basically what they did is they, they studied um, the current market, estimated what the future market is. They got a lot of public input. There were three um, public meetings. Um, one of them was very well attended, got some input from everybody um, on what they thought about EV charging um, and where the city currently is, where the city and the region, um, as Mark mentioned, should be. Um, since then, some things have changed, some things haven't. Um, a couple things you might be aware of or you might not is the there's a it's called the NEVI program. It's the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program that in the last year has awarded some projects in the area. Um, they're going to be putting a level three charging station at the uh, quick trip off of Washburn. So that's kind of um, in the, the eyes of the plan that was incorporated. So basically the gist of it is the uh, plan has determined that level one charging most people are doing at home. That's where they plug in overnight. Level two is something that potentially the city could do. Um, and that would be more for people that are looking to top off their charge um, if they're going to uh, work or they're going to the convention center for a couple hours or um, they're doing something during the day where they have a little bit of time and then level three would be the quick chargers which the NEVI plan seems to have covered pretty well. So this is an option um, for what could the city do if we determine in the future we want to invest in EV charging and the recommendation was to look at a pilot, um, selected a couple locations that uh, would be potential um, the ones that rose to the top were the parking lot across from the convention center and potentially Lakeshore Park um, for different reasons. The convention center being that it's uh, downtown and highly used for visitors and, and conventions and as well as um, empl employers and employees in that area. And then the park to do something a little alternative, the infrastructure was put in with the uh, park plans. So, and it would be another, it'd both be pilots to kind of see what the demand was and see if that's something that uh, the city needs going forward. Um, so, as Mark mentioned, this, this, it's a plan that was really pretty well thought out with a lot of public input over the last year and a half. Um, the MPO will be asking the policy board to adopt it um, and the city should it adopt it. Again, it's, you're not committing to funding anything. Um, you're basically just saying that we should have a plan. The Transportation Committee agreed that the city should have a plan. However, they didn't want to vote necessarily for any type of implementation, which I completely understand because we didn't have details on like, um, this is exactly what's being asked for, this is exactly what it's going to cost, and council obviously would have to approve that in a budgeting process. So all this plan would do, is it would basically make us um, ready for EV charging should we decide to apply for grants, number one, or two. In the past, we've had a couple uh, businesses that have offered to potentially donate charging stations. Um, but two years ago, when they asked, it was we were kind of like, I, maybe we don't really know wh how we would do that or where it would be. Now we have enough information where we could probably um, offer a little more guidance to that. So that's a real high level just what the plan is um, all about. So thank you. Anybody else? All right. If Thanks. nothing else, we'll move on to 21B, the uh, 7th Avenue reconstruction discussion. Do you have mm -hmm. anyone registered uh, for this? I, I don't have anybody registered. Okay. Um, did anybody want to come up and t I, I know most of you got a chance to, to talk last week, so thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Robbie has an update, and Mr. Garak, so we can fill you in what, where we're to date. Um, Excellent. I think that's what we were looking for. Yeah, and we're, yeah, we're, yeah. we're not done yet, but we wanted to keep you up to date. Thank you. 
And, and I think, you know, as, as we talked about it, you know, not wanting to make any assumptions uh, about, you know, what, what you may know of our systems, I wanted to start with a little bit of general background, if, if you could indulge me with that. Um, you know, so looking at our storm sewer system in the city, um, I would say around 90% of our storm sewers discharge to water bodies below the normal water level. Um, you know, that really causes water to, to back up into our storm sewer systems. And as we do sizing calculations to determine what size storm sewers we need to install, that, that is taken into account. Um, unfortunately, that, that is a, a challenge of being a, a community that it was very low, very flat, and built adjacent to a whole lot of water. Um, it was very convenient when the water was the highway and that was what was used. Uh, however, as we've transitioned from you know, water transportation to ground transportation and needing to get the water off of the streets, it's, it's created certainly a lot of challenges for us. And, and that's why you, know, you see some of the sizes of systems that are installed. Um, you know, I don't remember exactly what was in this one, Justin. Do you recall? It's a six foot by twelve foot box culvert. So, uh, six feet tall, at twelve feet wide. It's it, it, very large. You know, we talked in the workshop about congested right of ways. You know, twelve feet wide. That's inside. You know, that's got foot walls. That's fourteen feet outside. Um, in a sixty foot right of way, that's almost a third of the right of way, or at least a quarter of the right of way is just that one pipe. Um, the water level in, the, in Lake Winnebago and the Fox River are controlled by the Army Corps of Engineers uh, via the dams at the north end of Lake Winnebago. So, you know, as far as what the elevation of the water is in the system, again, that's, that's something that is beyond our control and fluctuates with rainfall and how the Army Corps controls the levels in Lake Winnebago via the dams. They're going to be lowering that soon, right, James? Uh, we're at the middle of October, so they will be you know, kind of starting the, the winter drawdown. Uh, they start a very slow drawdown through the fall, uh, generally speaking with a goal to get uh, water down to a certain level by the time ice starts forming. Uh, then they, they really don't want to keep taking it down much past ice out, otherwise you end up with voids between the water and the ice that cause unsafe ice conditions. Uh, so they are very conscious of that, but yes, they are, they are starting that drawdown now. Um, groundwater elevations are, you know, they are very seasonal and again, given the proximity to uh, the Fox River in this particular case, they can be impacted by the regulation of uh, Lake Winnebago and the Fox River. Getting into this project in particular, you know, given the proximity of the project to the Fox River and, and the tailwater impacts that we just talked about, um, there were a lot of design and construction uh, processes that were implemented that are really over and above normal design and construction methodologies. Uh, for example, the storm sewer, normally when storm sewer is con constructed, um, the joints are just a gasket. You know, there's a gasket slides over, uh, slides over one pipe, and it slides in, and it's just a gasket that forms kind of that seal to keep, you know, the water in the pipe. Uh, in the pipe, in this particular case, in addition to those gaskets, the outside of the box culvert has been wrapped with a, a, a mastic material again to provide an additional seal around that storm sewer. Um, bentonite dams have been installed at all the utility lateral trenches at the right of way line. Um, Really, the purpose for that is to reduce the likelihood of, you know, these pipes are bedded in clear stone, so water likes to flow through clear stone. Uh, so these bentonite dams are installed on those utility lateral tr uh, trenches to keep water that may be following the the mainline trenches from following the laterals back up and going directly uh, to the uh, to the foundations of the buildings. Uh, this this is something that we have experienced on other projects that are very near to the lake and the river. Um, you know, I think of one in particular up at Menominee Drive and, and Hickory Street. There was a property right on the corner across from the park that, you know, as the project got done, they, they were having some, you know, some similar types of issues with the, uh, a lot of groundwater and their sump pump running. Uh, in that case, we had not installed those bent night dams, so we went back after the fact and, and did install them, and, and that did, you know, reduce that, that impact that they were having. Additionally, within the right-of-way, uh, there were bentonite dams installed at the intersection of 6th Avenue and Iowa Street across all of the utility trenches. Again, the purpose for that is if there's you know, water trying to run up the pipe bedding from the river, installing that bentonite dam to isolate that so that that water can't keep flowing up those utility trenches. Um, so, so those are a lot of the things that anytime we're working near the water bodies, 
we are doing those things now because we have learned from past projects that we had to go back and implement after the fact. Uh, so we do that as a matter of course. Uh, the sanitary sewer in, in this area was uh, replaced as well. We've seen a lot of times with these old sanitary sewers, they leak. Um, they leak clear water, you know, groundwater leaks into the sanitary sewer system. You know, as, as you've looked at the capital improvement program for the last 15 years, there's been a light item for inflow and infiltration reduction in the sanitary sewer. Th this is a big part of that. Uh, state and federal laws do require sanitary system operators to eliminate that clear water. Uh, so again, re replacing the, the uh, the old sanitary sewer system that was uh, rather leaky with a new system that is sealed, um, it, it, it's removing a drain point that, that may have been draining some groundwater, but it, it is a requirement that we are taking those steps. Um, the location of the storm sewer within the right of way, it, really you know, it has no bearing on the groundwater because of all the steps that are being taken to eliminate the, the ability of the, the storm sewer to leak out or leak in. So the location of the storm sewer really doesn't uh, have a bearing on that. Um, a little bit of background on when the contractor started their work. Um, when they started construction on this project, one of the first things they did is uh, they, they installed groundwater dewatering wells so that as they're building the pipes and installing these pipe systems they're they're able to work kind of in the dry if you will um, those pipes those groundwater wells had to run for a few days to lower the groundwater in the area so they could accomplish that task in that manner so um, again that that goes to show there there is a lot of groundwater in the area um, you know, Justin and his staff have continued to uh, to monitor the situation, to, to meet with people. Um, we are currently in the process of trying to locate a hydrogeologist that could assist us in understanding what may be occurring with groundwater in this area. Uh, generally speaking, hydrogeologists work on a much more macro level. Uh, they don't usually get down into a, a block by block type of a situation. Uh, so we, we have been having some challenges. Several of the, uh, the firms and the staff that we've worked with over the years have said, you know, we don't have anybody that can handle that. Um, one of our firms that we have worked with thinks they, they may have somebody in another office out of state that uh, may be able to assist us. So, but we haven't um, gotten down that uh, avenue yet because they've just really notified us that they may have somebody in another state. Um, in the meantime, one of the additional things that we are looking at doing, you know, I mentioned the installation of a bentonite uh, kind of dam across uh, the utility trenches at um, Fifth and Iowa. We are looking at doing what's called a, a, a chemical grout injection, kind of a cutoff wall again on the upstream side of this project. So at Seventh and Michigan, um, the process there is the contractor will come in uh, and really they'll, they'll push a wand into the ground and high pressure inject uh, a grout chemical that reacts with water and it, it forms a seal, a barrier uh, to stop water from moving because you know we, we did have to connect to the old system so there may be water from that old system that's continuing to flow down and adding to these issues. So that is another step that we are working on with the contractor to have done. Uh, I have actually used uh, the subcontractor that's uh, doing this work, I have used them in, in other situations, um, you know, residential areas where we had a city storm sewer main in an easement flowing, you know, from the street through their yard to the lake. You know, the storm sewer pipe itself was maybe seven or eight feet from that particular house and it was the same thing, they were experiencing water. So we did a very similar thing, we in, did a ground injection between the lake and that house and another one between the uh, the street and that house and you know that did resolve the issue at that particular location so you know that is another um, step that we are taking to try to to isolate uh, isolate portions of the project so that we can uh, try not to do too much all at once so we can try to pinpoint what may or you know may not be a, a solution but we are continuing to take steps uh, within the right of way to try to deal with some of the groundwater and that, that's kind of the bullet points that I think we had talked about. Um, Mark, I don't know if you have anything you'd like yeah, to add to that. I think the, I, the idea behind that last one that James mentioned, and, and I've let James do most of this because this is a highly technical type of issue, but the, the logic that they explained to me was, you know, if this works, then we can maybe look at applying this to other areas. 
but we don't want to do overkill and then not figure out where the source of some of these uh, these groundwater infiltrations might be so we'll try one and then if that works then we'll take a look and and hopefully find a hydrogeologist that can help us this is a very specialized type of thing especially when you know we're so close to the water there's the groundwater is is literally you know within a couple feet of people's uh, foundations and things like that um, that's always existed but clearly these folks are having new experiences that they didn't have before and we can't just dismiss it so we're working on it and hopefully uh, I understand about half what James did hopefully you did better than that but we know that we need to keep working on this and we're going to continue uh, working through the uh, through this until we find somebody that can maybe help pinpoint some of the areas and we can and we're happy if you guys want to hang around we can talk to you afterwards fill you in on anything else but that's kind of where we're at right now all right councilmember Nichols thank you um, and James I really appreciate you going through that that's like Mark said that is the, the technical piece of this is something I'm never going to truly appreciate because I didn't go to school for it and I'm not the expert. So I really appreciate you walking through what it is and explaining it. I know that this is a, an inherited problem at a workshop earlier today. I challenged James and said, if we were building a brand new city from scratch, what would you do? And he said, that's something we dream of because you don't have to deal <laughs> with all the, the mistakes of the past. So I, I appreciate th th This would be a similar situation. Exactly. I'd put more fill in so it would be up higher. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's, that's super helpful. And, and I, I do see um, members of, of the Seventh Ave uh, community here. I, I was um, in their homes with Councilmember Larson on on Friday. I believe Councilmember Flom also joined their homes on Friday. And um, certainly, if if I were living in in their situation, I would I would be concerned and I'd be showing up at, at council meetings like like they have been. So I appreciate you all staying <coughs> engaged, and I encourage you all to stick around, like the city manager offered, and talk about those solutions. Um, I, I know that there was a concern at the last meeting, concern is too strong of a word, there was discussion about you know, litigation threats, and, and I'm sure Lynn can appreciate that by the time it gets to the lawyers, the damage is done, and it's, it's kind of too late to have the conversation to fix it. So I'm glad we're continuing to have a conversation here. Um, I think that when parties stop talking to each other and they start calling their lawyers, it's too late. So I'm glad we're continuing to talk. And, and I guess the last thing I'll say, um, as I think we can always take these lessons and, and apply them to the future. I know, like James said, we, we're a very low-lying community. Um, and I think we may be able to anticipate that these problems could happen in the future. And I think that being overly communicative with uh, neighborhoods when we think maybe this could happen and saying this is who you call, this is when you call, and this is when we're going to put the brakes on a project. Um, I, I know that there are, and, and I don't, I'm not going to say who's right and who's wrong, but I, I think that I'm told that there were instances when the contractor was told something, and I don't know what the communication structure is between the, the contractor and the city, and then the city and the residents. I think those are, those are things that we can certainly improve upon. Um, so I'm happy to brainstorm there or talk about what that could be. I'm not, again, I'm not pointing fingers. But I think if we talk about education, discussion, dialogue, and customer service as a theme here as, as learnings as we look at the next project. Um, just so that we're not in the, in the same situation later where we are inheriting the problems of the past and living in the reality of a low-lying community. Um, but I guess the last thing I'll say is, is I was in their basements and there is a, an amount of water there that certainly I'd be uncomfortable with. Um, so if we had prepared them that this could happen and this is, these are the steps we're going to take, I think that could have gone a long way. Um, and so for the future, I, I just want to take that lesson, I think. Uh, Council Member Flum. I would really echo a lot of those. Um, I was in their basements as well, and there is a sump pump in one of them running once a minute uh, at certain times, and she's getting notifications on her phone. Uh, and if something breaks, she's out of luck. And she recently renovated the place, and I think when we talk about customer service and communication, it's something that is very key for the future. Um, notifying neighborhood associations and saying, hey, look, if you see flooding, if you see something, say something. I was sent videos by some of the residents where the street looked like our lake. And I know it's not what the project is supposed to look like at the end of the day, um, but for residents who know that they're getting their street reconstructed and don't anticipate any sort of flooding, seeing that, that's extremely disconcerting. Uh, and so it's not, I mean, it's, this isn't a project that they asked for. This is a project that was put on the CIP. And to have their property values damaged is something that is uh, something that we could do much better on. Um, and so I know that wasn't, obviously it wasn't the intent to damage anybody's property, um, but I'm glad that we're working on finding a, um, 
somebody who could help pinpoint this. I'm certainly not an engineer. I do not know half of anything about this kind of stuff. You guys are the experts, um, but just please keep in touch with them. Please let them know uh, when we find somebody to help pinpoint the, the source here and um, just make sure that they, uh, they know that we're trying to do everything we can uh, to make sure that this doesn't get any worse for them. So um, I looked at the storm drain down there. The water level is very high. It hasn't rained in a few weeks, and I know they have concerns about when things freeze uh, and the ice, and I know there are mobility issues. Um, you know, we have residents there who like to go on walks who can't do that anymore. Uh, so I appreciate the update on this. I really do. Uh, and please keep me and the rest of council apprised on this as well as the residents. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Larson. Yeah, all the same, James, I really appreciate the update. I hope you guys appreciate that as well. That was helpful. That's, I mean, that it shows that why it's important for you to come here and tell us things. And we appreciate the invite to come see it. And it was daunting. It'd be frightening if that was happening to me. So I would encourage you, as DJ did also, to be in touch. Staff is right here. They want to talk with you. So this is that relationship we talked about when we were in your basements also. So hopefully that helps. And I look forward to hearing more about how this gets better going forward. Excellent. Um, just had a, a couple questions. And I, and I haven't been in any of your basements, but I, I have a wet basement. And I know what it looks, smells, and tastes like. Sometimes like you get that just feeling in it. And it's so terrible. But um, the. Uh, one of the things you said popped out to me, the um, water level of Lake Winnebago being controlled by the Corps of Engineers, correct? Yes. Uh, so even though it hasn't been rainy, that water level has been high, uh, it, correct? So like, uh, what, what I'm worried about is like, what happens when it does get rainy? Like, are, are we going to have it, is, does it build on top of that or does the system relieve? The <clears throat> the core had, and I, I didn't think to try to, to bring some of their uh, website information, but um, the core has a what they call as their uh, Lake, bed, Lake Winnebago operation. operation strategy. You know, so they have, you know, during the summer navigation season, they have a band that they are trying to navigate and keep the lake within. And there's a gauge station that they refer to a gauge elevation. So when you look at their website and you see a Lake Winnebago elevation, you know, right now you'll see a number probably somewhere around 3.0. Um, their summer operating band is between 2.9 and 3.2. Those numbers mean 2.9 feet above the, the datum elevation of that gauge station, so 2.9 to 3.3, or 2.9 to 3.2 feet above that. Um, <clears throat> that's what those numbers mean. During the winter time, they, their, their bottom out is usually around 1.7 feet. And then, you know, the goal is to try to slowly bring that up after ice out during the spring. Um, the strategy has been modified over the years, partially to try to promote submergent vegetation growth to tie up the sediments and the, and the nutrients in the, in the sediment. Okay. Um, as far as how high does it get, um, I believe the highest I think I have ever seen it on the gauge is maybe around 3.6. Um, and at that point, really when they get to about 3.5, we do have a street that has standing water on it that is not because the storm sewer doesn't drain, it's because that is the river level. Um, and that is Campbell Road just north of the Campbell Creek Bridge. Um, that is the first one to experience uh, standing water on the street. And that happens at around 3.5. You know, so that's, you know, that far above the top of their operating band. So, you know, they're the swings in the elevation of the lake usually not more than you know two three four tenths of a foot you know during the summer months so um, you know when there is a lot of rain you know they're continually watching the forecast and they're making changes to the number of gates that are open on the dams uh, some of the dams are owned and operated by the army corps of engineers some of them are under private ownership but those owners and operators do work with the corps so when the corps says hey we need you to do a, B, and C, or X, Y, and Z, as far as opening up, opening up gates to try to bring uh, that level down in the lake. You know, they are they have a very strong working relationship. Um, that being said, they also have to be very cautious about not pushing too much water out of the lake because they have flooding problems on the other side of the dams. Right. Um, in the Nina area, there's a, an island, I believe it's Scobie Island, uh, when they get over a certain discharge rate out of Lake Winnebago from those dams, it actually floods the island. Uh, so they, they, they have to be very, very cautious about where they're, they're running. What, one thing I might just add to that is, those are great numbers, but anecdotally, um, the, if you look in 
Seventh Avenue, the inlets out there today, that the water you see in there, that elevation is the lake and the river. And one of the things that James mentioned early on in this is we take that into account in the sizing for our sewers. So where I can't say it's not going to get higher than that, but we do account for that lake and river level pushing back against the storm sewer when it rains. It takes the rain water to continue to push it out. It's head pressure. So the higher the water is on this side, it's going to all push itself out. So it will take water on this side to get it out. That doesn't mean it's going to flood the street but it does take water elevation on this side to continue to push it out into the, the lake and the river. Okay. Um, thank you very much. One thing I noticed growing up, we had a long country driveway quarter mile uh, of gravel and every two years we had to fill it with um, gravel in the same spots uh, because water is fairly undefeated in the way that it wants to run. So um, continue to look at any technology we can um, you know, the, the, the new dams things that you're talking about to try to block up some of the flow to be able to control that um, because water is, is, I'm not an engineer, but it's a tricky beast like that. So, um, but please continue to con uh, communicate with them, communicate with us on what we're uh, going to be doing here. Uh, anything else anybody on, have on this? Yeah. We'll keep this on subsequent Thank agendas. You. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <coughs> All right, we have a couple uh, future agenda items, meetings and workshops coming up. Uh, just a small one next week uh, for two days. Uh, if you want to cover anything you uh, have before us, I know we all got our copy of the budget. Yeah, just more just about being there at 8 a.m. Uh, I know that Councilmember Nichols won't be there, so if you got questions, I think, you know, touch base with Julie and um, you're welcome to watch it. It will be on video if, uh, if, you, if, if you have some uh, sleeping issues that'll that'll put you to sleep but it may it may inspire you so certainly we want everybody to uh, to be there so we can uh, do presentations from each of the departments I think we sent a schedule out to everybody so you know what the order of appearance will be um, so we've got that and then just a reminder on uh, Wednesday November 6th is our, our public hearing our official public hearing and then based on the previous sessions as well as the public input session. If there's any final tweaks accounts wants to make, typically they do it at that meeting so that we bring it back to you on November uh, 12th for, for final action. That's good. Uh, Councilman Resslinger. Yeah, actually, I had a couple things for future agenda items, if I can get that in there. Sure. Okay. Um, Mr. Olaf, I had some conversations recently with some individuals um, to have, and I know Fond du Lac does this, they have a day where they have a garbage pickup today where you can put anything out on the curb and they come pick it up and there's no charger. So um, I would like some kind of analysis, kind of like we had today on the underground utilities, uh, uh, an analysis on that. Is it, you know, is it a good idea? Is it a bad idea? How much does it cost? Do we have the equipment for that? Do we have the employees for that? So just, so if, you know, if councilman wants to bring that forward as some type of uh, implement that as uh, something that we do uh, in the course of a year, uh, I would appreciate that. Sure. Councilmember Fulham asked the same question to me just yesterday, oh. I believe. So wow, I'm thinking like and, and I had texted you on that as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Or, or maybe maybe it was Mr. Bulo. Not Jacob gave me a look like we look we look really there. similar. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, I don't know if we necessarily need to workshop, but. You know, it's been a couple of years since we've been asked that, and uh, we'll talk to Public Works and uh, have some information that we can provide you. Okay. Uh, the second thing is I want to touch briefly on the, the issue that was brought up again tonight, the homelessness issue. Um, I know that I've had some contact with you, Mr. Roloff, regarding this. I was going to have a meeting, and then um, it got canceled. Um, nobody wants this situation. And I, I've got to be candid here. I'm really kind of ignorant to the whole, I mean, why do we have this? Um, I've talked to people that believe that we do absolutely nothing for the situation. And now we're criminalizing it. So I, I feel sorry for the police. I, I mean, they are in an absolute no-win situation. Whatever they do, it's going to be wrong uh, for some people. Um, but the fact is, is if some people are violating the laws or ordinances, 
you get punished. I, I mean, I know that's mean sometimes, but that's the way it works. Um, but there is an issue. And so I, I think we need to, um, myself as a council member, and I think the rest of the, the city should really look at you know what what's going on here I mean I know the the county executive had some issues with um, people on county property I know that the chief has discussed a few different issues so I think I don't know if we can all get together and talk about this or ha has there been something done or is there something that we're gonna do in the future because that's what we're here for I mean we are here to solve problems and first of all we have to understand what the problem is and then um, once we assess what that problem is, um, if we have the power or, or the means to do it, we should do, be doing something about it. Uh, the item's not on the agenda, so I don't want to delve into it too much, but uh, Chief uh, Smith will be here next week, and part of his budget is talking about some of the things that the police department has done and is proposing to do. Uh, that's one, only one aspect of that. And there's a group that's been meeting uh, that uh, one of the outcomes was what Chief Smith is proposing in the budget, but there are other issues and and so I think there's plenty to talk about with this and happy to put it on a future agenda. Deputy Mayor Bulow and I have had numerous conversations on this very topic because it's not just one thing. I mean, um, uh, the, the the lady who spoke earlier this evening, you know, shared with you some some graphic details about you know what's out there. Um, and it's not a simple solution. If it was, if it was, this council would approve it in a second. I know that. Um, but there, there are so many complicating issues. So um, I, I would start with Chief Smith in our discussion next week. Uh, he's got some information prepared that uh, he's not here this evening, and it's not on the agenda. So right. it is on the agenda next week, yeah. and so we can talk about it. And then if you guys want to do a follow-up at a subsequent council meeting, that's entirely appropriate. Yeah, I think yeah, I'm I'm quite confident that behind the scenes there are you know been many meetings and 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 issues uh, brought up and you know ways of trying to resolve this. But I think it's time now that we come forward and explain what we're doing or not doing, um, as it were, um, and say here 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 are the issues um, and we're working on resolving them. Here's what we're going to do. And here's when we're going to do it, or we're not going to do it. Or whatever. The, I just think that so many people, including myself, and I'm one of seven council members, I don't understand it, and that's not a good thing. So um, shame on me. And but uh, I think we need to get it. We all need to get educated on this and, and try to resolve it because it's you know like I said, nobody wants this. There is technically a little bit on the agenda, so I'm just going to speed ahead. And then if you want to keep asking, under outstanding issues, the second item. Um, uh, about engage governmental and nonprofit entities in the region to reduce and prevent homelessness. And the report is staffs participating in groups organized by the Community Foundation to review short-term and long-term issues. Report from the group is forthcoming. So there is a group has been looking at this and been engaged for a good six, eight months so far. And then staff will submit a proposal to respond to group's report in the 2025 budget. Only one aspect of it. It's not, not the be all end all, but I know Councilmember Larson's aware of it, and and I think the Chief's prepared to to talk about that. So, um, so I was able to squeeze it on the agenda for you there. But I think listen to the Chief on Tuesday, Tuesday I believe is his presentation, and then you guys can tell me where you want to go from there. Okay, great. Thank you very much. The only thing I'll say to that, since it's kind of on the agenda, um, and Amber can tell you this as well, if we have 40 unhoused individuals out there, it's not fo it's not one problem, it's 40 problems. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really, it's not a lack of want to. Um, we'll talk more. Right. All right. Uh, Council member uh, announcements and statements. All right, Council Member Um Coming up, uh, I know that I think most of us were invited to this. The Oshkosh Hmong New Year Festival is at Sunnyview Expo Center this Saturday. Uh, it's all day, so uh, I would encourage everybody to go. It is a fantastic time. I always like to go to the Hmong festivals. Uh, um, excellent food if you like egg rolls, and great culture and great people. So, excellent. Encourage people to go. All right. If nothing else, we'll go on to uh, City Manager announcements and statements. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, in your packet, there's a um, update 
on the hours for absentee voting, in-person absentee voting. I don't know if Jake can get it up there. Oh, very good. Thank you, Jake. Uh, it started today, um, and that member of the council had asked that we could run a couple uh, of these events until 7 p.m. Uh, today was until 7 p.m., and next Monday will also be to 7 p.m. Then it's pretty much 8 to 4.30 um, on every day except November 1st when it'll be 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. We always go to 5 p.m. on the, the, the very last day. And the very last day is the Friday before the election, not the day before the election. That's really crucial to point out. And the council also asked for some Saturday hours. Uh, we brought those back, and it'll be this Saturday from 8 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Once again, in-person absentee voting is at 19 East Irving, which is at the corner of Jefferson uh, and Irving. So um, please know the location because it's not at City Hall this year. Statewide, there were some issues, some printing issues, because it sounds like the computers were slow. I'm going to defer to Diane, okay. although she's been wrestling with this all day. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long day. Um, I did forward you a message that I received from the Wisconsin Election Commission. I also sent it on to you, Mark. Um, they are aware of the problem. The problem was down in Madison, there was a hold up with us printing the actual labels that go on the actual absentee envelopes. So it was just very slow. That's why I think we had the major line. Um, if it was at City Hall today, nothing would have been different. It, it has nothing to do with our connections or our anything. Um, it was just down in Madison and it was an issue. Um, I hope to have a number maybe tomorrow to let you know how many people came through today cool. and then um, I could tweak it and find out what's going on for the rest of the rest of the dates that we have. Would love to see that number yeah. when, tomorrow. Yeah, when you I'd like it. to see what <laughs> what today was. Yeah. They're, they're not answering me. Either they're <laughs> ignoring me or they're really busy. <laughs> So. And just because it's related to, to voting and we're, we're two weeks away, there is a, a city drop box as well. Is that, is that right? Thank you. Yes, it is located right outside City Hall, and you can drop it off 24-7. Uh, and uh, you know, we pick it up regularly, uh, so it's very secure. Uh, it's attached to the building, um, so it doesn't walk away or anything like that. So we feel very confident that uh, your ballots here are very safe and secure. Thank you for asking that. I have a few more things. The third quarter strategic plan dashboard has been posted and you're welcome to look at it. And uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick, I'm sure can answer any questions you might have or with some of the departments. A um, couple memos in the packet regarding some uh, grant agreement with the Public Service Commission for an energy innovation grant that uh, we're going to be receiving. A cooperative purchase of a leaf vacuum for a stormwater utility. And with the leaves falling, the vacuum is very important. Um, professional services agreement for uh, our elevator modernization consulting for the library and the public museum there we're doing them together and saving some money doing that and then uh, roof replacement survey for general services our budget has an, an allowance for roof uh, replacement this is we every few years we do a survey just to uh, reprioritize our project so we kind of know where we're at so uh, and then I have outstanding issues um, council member you brought up the uh, uh, homeless issue certainly happy to answer any questions if you have any additional questions about anything else on uh, in that other than that that's all I have with apologies I actually missed uh, uh, council member flow so clerk Bartlett uh, in your email it says uh, that WEC has added capacity to the system so it should have been resolved this past afternoon so voters could expect potentially shorter waits tomorrow is that correct I fingers hope. crossed <laughs> okay yeah <I> hope so. <laughs> all right thank you thank you from your lips <laughs> Thank you, right? Anybody else have anything? All right, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I haven't talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> you can test it.